Imagine you're a resident of a small ranching town in the middle of nowhere. You moved away from the city to live a quiet, peaceful life. You know literally all of your neighbors. There's only about 50 of you in total. You go to the town cafe every Saturday morning, the only cafe in town, and you grab some pancakes, bacon, eggs, hash browns, coffee, and you attend church on Sunday. Life is predictable, no surprises, and you like it that way. And then one day you read the news and you see that a religious leader in India has purchased an enormous ranch just outside your town. Sounds strange, something interesting to talk about, but then you put it out of your mind until the first wave of people dressed in crimson clothing show up. They tell you they're followers of Bhagwan Rajneesh and they just want to farm the land. You're a little weirded out. You've never seen people who dress like they do before in real life. But, you know, for the most part, they stick to staying on the ranch and you're not too bothered. But then more and more of them just keep coming, bringing with them strange ideas and practices that don't fit in with the ideals of small town America that you're used to. You learn they worship a man who claims that religion has no meaning. You hear that they supposedly have wild sex parties and violently assault each other during what is supposed to be meditation sessions. Now you're thinking, who the hell are these people? Then they start to encroach upon your town bit by bit until the streets that used to be empty are now full of people dressed in red, the Rajneeshis. Then they start buying up vacant homes in your little town. They buy that cafe. They replace the mayor and city council with their own people. They form their own police force. They change the name of your town. They change the name of the streets. They open up a vacant area to public nudity. Suddenly you feel like a stranger in your town because suddenly you are a stranger in your town. All of this really happened in the small town of Antelope, Oregon. And not that long ago. It happened in the early 1980s. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and his cult of Sansanians fled India and purchased a ranch out in the middle of nowhere, initially claiming all they wanted to do was farm that land. But that wasn't true. Rajneesh had something different in mind. He wanted to build his own city, a utopia that was to serve as a haven for an eventual 100,000 followers he hoped were going to live there. His ideas thrilled his followers, but they terrified the people of Antelope and surrounding areas who had never seen anything like him before. Bhagwan was a revolutionary. That can't be denied. He touched millions of lives and his teachings continue to reach more souls today. He preached a message of a new religion that rejected religion. The idea of a new man not bound to any rules, but living in harmony with himself and the world. He claimed he was enlightened. And if you just followed his ways, you could be enlightened as well. One of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh's most famous quotes is, I am here to seduce you into a love of life, to help you to become a little more poetic to help you die to the mundane and to the ordinary so that the extraordinary explodes in your life. Sounds nice. Rajneesh taught his followers that the religions they'd grown up with no longer mattered, that they had never mattered, that the path to true enlightenment included rejecting nearly everything they'd ever known and participating in dynamic meditations that would help them experience the divine. When the Rajneeshis moved to Oregon, they brought with them strange ideas that clashed strongly with conservative American values, and many Oregonians wanted them gone. Right? And they weren't shy about telling them or local journalists and reporters that they wanted them out. But Bhagwan's followers, led by his ruthless secretary and second command, Sheila, were determined to remain in their haven, Rajneesh Puram. And to try and do so, they engaged in bioterror, wiretapping, voter fraud, immigration fraud, assault, even attempted assassinations. Today, we'll discuss Bhagwan Rajneesh and his enlightened, supposedly, ideas, how his following began in India the Rajneeshi battle with the people of Antelope, Oregon, and Bhagwan and his people's inevitable downfall in another cult, cult, cult edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sack. A cult of the Curious has returned once more this week. Uh, feeling pretty low energy still, a little foggy, but much better, much better. Hopefully sounding much better than I did during my last recording. Uh, hail Nimrod, thank you for guiding my research this week. Hail Lucifina, thanks for letting my wife Lindsay play sexy nurse to me this past week. Uh, praise Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. A uh, couple quick announcements. They were longer last week, so I'll get to them fast this week. Hope I had fun with some Springfield, Missouri meat sacks this past weekend. Got Milwaukee coming up this weekend. The Improv in Davenport, Iowa, Chicago, Illinois, the following weekend. And then I'm just focused on family and podcasting for the summer. Uh, tour dates up at dancummins.tv. And also, you can find me, I always forget to say it, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, at Dan Cummins Comedy. And you can find me on uh, TikTok. And I don't even remember what my TikTok handle is. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and find it right now. 
because we've had some videos. Uh, we've been blown up on TikTok. What's what's going on? Oh, it's just it's at Dan Cummins Comedy as well. I should remember that. Somebody somebody picked up Dan Cummins on all the social media places. Uh, anyway, a real quick merch announcement. Time Suck Classic Tea hitting the Bad Magic store today. Very cool Coke inspired logo variant on a vintage Heather Red Tea. It's very similar to a Nola uh, Coke parody T-shirt that I already own. Check it out at BadMagicMerch.com. Uh, last reminder that the Bad Magic charity for May is the Halo Dental Network. Founded by Dr. Brady Smith, Halo Dental Network is a coalition of dental professionals who donate their services to the dental underserved. Uh, services include dental implants, veneers, fillings, and crowns. If you want to learn more, go to halodentalnetwork.org. Okay, that's it. Since last week's announcements were longer, let's just be done with that shit and just get into this. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh controlled his followers or set them free through a path of enlightenment, depending on uh, who you ask, how you look at it, by preaching about the concept of a, a new man, a truly awakened person who lived in harmony with their surroundings. Potential followers fell so in love with this kind of vague, uh, nice, pleasant sounding idea that they were willing to donate vast sums of money to Rajneesh and his organizations, sometimes give them all of their assets and money and isolate themselves from their families and friends. Louis Manza, chair and professor of psychology at Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania, perhaps Louis Manza, spoke with Verge about how uh, cult leaders like Bhagwan exert control over their followers. We've covered this, uh, you know, numerous times before this concept, but always nice to have a little refresher. And we haven't shared Professor Manza's perspective on this before. Manza teaches that cult leaders often employ either physical and psych or psychological control or both. Physical control can be isolation, strict rules, punishments for infractions. Psychological control, uh, often more powerful. Cult leaders often master how to form bonds with followers to establish a very strong level of trust, an unnaturally strong level of trust that allows them to encourage members to leave their old lives and fully immerse themselves in the cult. And once that powerful bond is established, the cult leader will manipulate followers by withholding love, affection, rewards, or community from anyone who asks too many questions, disobeys too many teachings, the ones who listen and obey are rewarded. It's really just some classic behaviorism being employed here. Positive and negative reinforcement, right? Behave well, be given what you so desperately crave. Behave poorly, have what you so desperately crave taken away from you. People who are experiencing a period of psychological instability, sometimes described as a spiritual crisis or an existential crisis, sometimes just described as doing some soul searching, are most vulnerable to being recruited into cults. They often feel like they're missing something important, right? Love, family, sense of belonging, even the very meaning of life. Manza said, it's just the idea that someone needs some type of social connection. I think it's one of the primary forces. If they simply can't find a way on their own to fulfill that, and then someone comes along and says, hey, we have this group and you're welcome, join us. It can be a very subtle thing at first. If you want to get someone in and you know how to manipulate people, it's fairly simple to do. You bring them in, you establish a relationship, and then you just start sucking them in more and more. And eventually, someone just crosses the line and they're in. Hmm, sucking them in. What is he talking about? If you're lonely and right, and you feel like you're on an island without a herd of like-minded people around you, meat sack, don't let uh, that powerful and primal urge drive you into the arms of a dangerous cult leader. Instead, uh, if you do a quick little search on Facebook, you can find our various Time Suck based private Facebook groups to join. Uh, you can join Time Sucks, a Discord channel. Uh, you can find the Suck on Reddit, many other places. Uh, there's so many episodes to listen to. You can just sign up to Patreon for you know, additional weekly installments of uh, the Secret Suck, the Time Sucks Inner Circle. But anyway, don't get sucked into a cult. Unless, of course, it's the cult of the curious. That's totally different. I haven't tried to fuck any members yet. I haven't claimed to be God's only true prophet or to know when the world's ending, or how to avoid perishing when it does yet. I don't know, uh, you know, uh, how to achieve true enlightenment. I'm not claiming I know that yet. Cult, cult, cult! Hell no, Rod. Uh, seriously, though, Rajneesh was able to attract a large number of highly educated people into his cult. A uh, survey by the University of Oregon Psychology Department found that 64% of 700 followers of his they interviewed had college degrees. 81% came from white-collar families. Rather than targeting the poor, disillusioned, and desperate, uh, you know, people start struggling to achieve any financial stability, he attracted many affluent people who have been uh, left feeling unfulfilled with their materialistic success. And we will learn this is no accident. He, uh, he targeted people with money. He did not hide the fact that he enjoyed money. He specifically uh, went after people with means. 
This is actually not that uncommon in cults. Many have targeted single men and women from upper middle class or, you know, uh, middle class backgrounds who've been taught through education to be open to new ideas and experiences. Rajneesh appealed to Westerners, particularly, uh, because of his blend of humanistic psychology, the human potential movement that had risen out of the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s uh, that was popular in New Age circles, and Eastern mysticism. Let me explain each of these beliefs a bit, starting with humanistic psychology. Humanistic psychology is fucking garbage and only complete idiots and one-eyed gravy slurping charlatans believe it has any value whatsoever. Uh, JK, I just feel like throwing out a little nonsensical, oddly specific uh, insult there. No, human psychology has a, was a response when it was originated to Freudian psychology and behaviorism. Humanism defined very generally is the belief that humans are unique beings and should be recognized and treated as such by psychologists and psychiatrists. Right? What, 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 what applies to one doesn't apply to all kind of thinking. Humanists are concerned with individual growth and improvement in the areas of love, fulfillment, self-worth, autonomy. Right? It's different for each person how to, how to achieve those. Uh, 20th century American psychologist Abraham Maslow, founding father of humanism, taught that humans should focus on self-actualization, which is going to look a little different for each person, and achieving peak experiences. He established his now famous hierarchy or pyramid of needs in 1943. Uh, Let me share these needs of his as I interpret them. Physiological needs. That lays at the bottom of the pyramid. I always liked this pyramid when I studied it many years ago. Uh, The need for air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, shelter from the elements, sleep, clothing. These are the basic things you need not to thrive, but to simply just not die. Right? If these needs are not met, the rest of the pyramid, it doesn't fucking matter because you're not going to live long enough to fulfill any other needs. Safety needs. That's the next level up on this pyramid. The ones you seek to fulfill after your very, very basic needs are met. These include uh, the need for employment. If your financial needs are not provided to you, the need to own your own property or at least rent your own space to have a place that is yours, Uh, access to healthcare, access to law enforcement to feel safe, or at least access to something you can use to protect yourself. If your physiological needs are then met uh, or met, you know, safety needs can be thought of as your ability to feel secure and not having those physiological needs uh, constantly threatened. Love and belonging on the next level. Uh, Say you have your own place and a job that pays all your bills. You're no longer worried about where your next meal is coming from. Now you have the luxury of putting a lot of energy into friendships and or romance and to spending more quality time with your family or perhaps building out a family of your own. These relationships, of course, can and do exist on the first two levels, but you're not able to prioritize them the same way unless your basic physiological and safety needs are met. Above the love and belonging level, esteem prestige, feelings of accomplishment, right? So you now have a measure of financial stability. You got, you got friends, you got love. You're, you're, you're getting, you're getting the sex of a family, biological or otherwise. Now you have the luxury of focusing really uh, on the questions of, you know, what do I want to accomplish in this world? What legacy do I want to leave behind? What kind of reputation do I want to have amongst my colleagues? And there's another level above that. The last level on the pyramid, that's self-actualization. This is the one Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh claimed to be able to unlock for you, give you the fucking cheat code for. The one he told followers he could guide them into accomplishing. Going to be a little different for every person. It's the desire to fulfill one's true potential, right? To be the most one can be, to be able to both identify and pursue one's utmost desires, to no longer feel held back by the trappings of the day-to-day financial concerns, worries for security, worries for romantic love or family or friendship even worry about reputation in some sense. On this level lies a chance to understand the nature of divinity or at least feel satisfied with not knowing. Self-actualization is about achieving true inner peace, waking up each day in a joyous state, thankful for another chance to bask in the glory of the living, to go to bed each night content with what the day and life has given you. Your personal potential is fully realized after basic bodily and ego needs have been fulfilled if you're able to become fully self-actualized. Self-actualized. Essentially, to reach the top of the pyramid is to know, you know, like true inner peace, to live in harmony with the world around you, neither wanting nor needing anything else from it other than what you already have. And it sounds pretty fucking great, right? I'm chasing that more and more myself. Many of us chase it. Some of us want to be shown the path of this self-actualization. How do we get there, right? Which could also be referred to as enlightenment uh, more than others. And we'll give anything to someone we truly believe can show us that way. And Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, Right, he played into that big time. He claimed to be that person. Oh, I fucking got you. I got you, bro. Just come over here, over here. Just join my cult. And here's the path. 
right? The needs discussed in this tip of the pyramid, they're, they're a little murkier than the needs in the levels below them. More open to interpretation, more easy to be conned by someone trying to say they can give them to you, right? Bhagwan knew that. You can't trick someone into making them think they've been fed when they're starving or make them think they've been giving shelter when they're left out in the elements. Satisfying the needs of the other levels, uh, it's much more concrete. Uh, you know, it's harder to fake. But you can essentially kind of hypnotize and brainwash someone into thinking that they have found their one true actualized purpose, right? You have shown them the way uh, by giving them some, you know, special role inside of your cult. Cult after cult has proven that you can do this. And then when the cult falls apart and the members flung back into the world, they often quickly tumble back to the bottom of the fucking pyramid and realize they were never at the top. They just let someone convince them they were at the top. So that's that. That's, uh, so let's break down the human potential movement a bit now. The Esalen Institute, founded in Big Sur, California in 1962, was the home of the human potential movement, a phrase coined by Aldous Huxley. The human potential movement was another term for humanistic psychotherapies that became popular in the 60s and 70s. Human potential focused on each person's individual growth rather than forcing individuals to fit into society's standards. Right, this movement highlighted similarities between cathartic therapies, peak experiences, and elements of Eastern religions. This movement also emphasized the development of individuals through encounter groups, sensitivity training, and primal therapy. Reminds me a bit of Synanon when you really look into some of it, that weird therapy-based cult we talked about in the Elon School Suck. Remember them? They loved unorthodox therapy sessions that uh, often became pretty, pretty confrontational. There was a Synanon game, a therapy session where one member would talk about themselves, reveal personal problems, then endure intense criticism by their peers and be mocked for their personal disclosures. The criticism they endured was often yelled, frequently peppered with verbal abuse. And then the Elan School made this type of therapy even more abusive with their general meetings. Some poor fucking teen would have to disclose why they've been sent to Elan. You know, something, uh, you know, possibly embarrassing to them, uh, you know, accused of promiscuity, for example. And then they would be forced to endure other teens taunting, screaming at them, calling them a whore, slut, etc. cetera. Uh, surprise, surprise, that type of abusive therapy, it didn't actually fucking help those kids. You know, crazy, right? Uh, the encounter groups within the human potential movement overall, though, thankfully not uh, abusive like that. In their encounter groups, participants meet, meet with the leader to increase self-awareness and social skills through emotional sharing and confrontation, but you know, usually less abusive than what I just laid out again. Uh, and primal therapy was a form of humanistic therapy that originated in the 1970s. Now, participants were encouraged to relieve, relive, excuse me, painful events and release feelings through screaming or crying rather than analysis. Uh, Rajneesh incorporated these methods into his famous dyna dynamic meditation practices. And you can find videos of people doing this online. You can find uh, videos online of Rajneesh just, <laughs> it's fucking mayhem. Screaming, crying, I mean like hysterically, aggressively crying. Uh, laughing hysterically, rolling around on the floor in these dynamic meditation sessions. Uh, <laughs> maybe it helps some people. I don't think I can take it seriously. Uh, you know, they're, they're being encouraged by their session leaders just to, you know, get it all out. Just get it all out. Oh man. Yeah. No, it does, uh, does not look like my cup of tea. I'll, I'll stick to good music, nature, shrooms, uh, occasional one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. Uh, the concept of the self is another main point of humanism. Individuals perceive the world according to their own experiences. Right? This perception affects their personality, leads them to direct their behavior to satisfy the needs of the self. And I like this, right? We're all a little bit different. Humanists, uh, also adopt an existential view. The end goal of satisfying the needs of the self is to seek out the meaning of life for oneself. When McCormack, co-founder of Mother Jones Magazine, wrote in an article for New Republic about how Bhagwan leaned on the human potential movement principles, writing the union of Western psychology and Eastern mysticism became a central goal for the human potential movement, and this was precisely the area in which Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh excelled. At his so-called ashram, ashram in Pune, India, he juxtaposed, juxtaposed, wow, there we go, experimental avant-garde Western therapies such as primal, uh, gestalt, and encounter with classic Eastern meditations like Kundalini Yoga and Zazen, just as they were doing at uh, Esalen. In fact, Rajneesh's uh, ashram became known as Esalen East. And an ashram is a uh, Eastern term for uh, like a monastery, hermitage, or just some other kind of place of religious retreat. And Esalen, actually the Esalen Institute, is a retreat center and compound in Big Sur, California, a place that played a big role in the human potential movement in the 60s, established in 1962, that is still there. Still in operation, uh, continues to offer classes in humanistic alternative education. 
Back in the 70s, when Bhagwan was gaining international popularity despite the counterculture movement of the 60s, most Westerners were expected still to uh, live a traditional life. Right? Graduate high school, earn a college degree, get a job, get married, have kids, work for 40 plus years, you know, and then uh, have your kids repeat the process that you, you know, just went through. But because of the counterculture movement, many young people were still questioning everything. The government, religion, their parents, traditional ideals. They were still looking for answers to the meaning of life. I guess every generation, you know, does that in their own way. For some, maybe it's uh, the meaning of life is just to live, just to work. I don't know. Uh, Bhagwan offered these answers. Going forward in today's suck, we're going to discuss the beliefs, structures, rules, finances, daily life, and problems of the Rajneesh movement, a.k.a. the Rajneesh cult, a.k.a. the antelope organ cult. Then we're going to cover a timeline of the cult from its origin to the present day. And yes, in, this, in, le- in a less culty form, uh, this belief system is very much still around today. All right, so what, is, so what are the basics of Bhagwan's belief system? Well, he was most well-known for his practice of dynamic meditation. We touched on that earlier. Let me more fully explain it now. The goal of dynamic meditation is to experience the divine. So pretty lofty goal, right? Uh, did I do it right? I don't know. Did you experience the divine? I don't think so. Well, then more practice, more crying, more screaming. Uh, dynamic meditation can actually consist of several exercises. A former Rajneeshi described an account of how dynamic meditation typically worked in that Netflix documentary came out several years, years ago, Wild Wild Country. Uh, everyone was blindfolded at first. Docu-series, I guess. Uh, they practiced rigorous breathing and hyperventilation, followed by screaming. Then they put their hands above their head, jumped up and down, shouted, hoo, 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 hoo. The meditation ended by everyone laying quietly on the ground. And people fucking loved it. Uh, of course they did. They loved it in the same way that people love a drug-fueled rave. Meditation, if I, haven't, if I haven't said this before, but I think I have, but I'm not sure, when done correctly combined with like chanting music, you know, can cause your body to release chemicals that truly do get you high. Like you can even hallucinate off of meditation. You can feel true euphoria. It, it replicates the same chemical processes in your brain that certain drugs do. Some of this new age shit, it essentially just teaches you how to, you know, fucking get high without having to ingest actual drugs. The release of endorphins, dopamine, etc., in the body, in the body, similar to the effects of you know drugs like um, you know like Molly, or even like shrooms. This natural high allows you to regulate your emotions, better overcome distressing situations. So yeah, that's fucking appealing. Of course, it's appealing. You feel magical, you know, but but you don't need all the dogma around it to feel magical. You could just go do that shit by yourself, or get a bunch of friends together and do it and get the same shit, uh, or just you know do uh, certain drugs. I saw a version of the Rajneeshi dynamic meditation. Um, yeah, in a, in a vice doc from a few years ago, oh man, uh, it's where a bunch of followers met in Toronto, a bunch of, uh, followers of Bhagwan's teachings. Uh, and it's fucking wild again. Uh, German filmmaker Wolfgang, oh boy, Dubro, Drabawolny, Drabawolny, maybe, uh, would release footage of cult activities like these to the public back when the compound was still going strong in Antelope, Oregon, and it freaked, uh, those people out too. Uh, he secretly filmed one of the famed encounter groups at Asho Rajneesh's ashram, in Pune, India, back in the late 70s. I'll show another name I'll explain at the end of the episode that Rashnish Bhagwan would change his name to. Uh, the film showed extremely shocking and graphic footage of naked men, women, screaming, crying, rolling on the floor, wrestling, assaulting one another, sitting quietly, and also having some sort of dance party. Yeah, his, his groups got a little fucking wilder than a lot of other similar organizations. Footage like this became, you know, very concerning to conservative Westerners in Oregon once the cult settled, settled there. Oregonians, you know, were worried about uh, a Rajneesh takeover. Like, what the fuck are these people doing? Rajneesh also taught uh, that sex was the first step to achieve super consciousness. Teachings like that, not surprisingly, led to a lot of rumors that the Rajneeshis were uh, a sex cult. And they kind of were. And in some ways, there were more than that, but uh, more more on some disturbing sex shit in a bit here. Uh, Bhagwan preached a lot of sexy ideas that came across to followers as new and exciting. He'd say things people weren't used to hearing from someone seen as a religious leader. He'd say, I'm not special in any sense. I'm not claiming that I'm the son of God. I'm simply saying one thing, that I was asleep. Now I am awake. You are asleep and you can be awake also. I will go on trying to help people be awake. The awakened man will be the new man. He will not be Christian. He will not be Hindu. He will not be Mohammed. He will not be Indian. He will not be German. He will not be English. He will simply be an awakened being. I gotta say, out of all the religious cult leaders' messages we've covered so far, I might like this sales pitch the best. Has a very Team Meat Sack vibe to it. Much better pitch than the world is full of horrible, horrible sin and sinners and God's wrath is coming soon. And if you want to survive the apocalypse, you must do as I say, for I'm God's only living prophet and only I know what you must do to survive the coming end times. 
That pitch may be the most common cult leader pitch. Also, generally speaking, my least favorite. Some cult leaders twist it into uh, much more abusive forms than others, but it, it always sucks. It's always a lie. Initially, on the surface, at least, the sales pitch of, I'm, I'm not a God or a prophet or a son of God, and I don't even claim to know the nature of God, but I do know how uh, to live your best life. I mean, it does sound pretty fucking good. Sounds somewhat reasonable, even, even on the surface. Rajneesh was very good at sounding reasonable. Uh, he wasn't a reasonable man in the end. He, well, I don't think he was a good dude in the end, but he knew how to play the part, especially early on. Uh, Rajneesh preached that he wanted to create a new man that lived in harmony with nature and other races and nationalities with this new man, and, and man in this case encompassing both men and women, uh, all races, cultures, and religions could live together with mutual respect for one another. Mm, I think he's being pretty optimistic here in respect to different religions living in harmony and probably lying a bit. I don't even know if he believed that. Probably just trying to not be inflammatory. I think the truth was he wanted to replace all the religions of the world with his vision of enlightenment, definitely towards the end. Because there's no fucking way we all get along with each other with the current various, this way is the only way spiritual belief systems we have in place. They are not compatible with one another. Uh, Rajneesh also spoke on the problems in the West and the East. Right? He said the East has remained lopsided because of the so-called spirituality. It has remained poor, unscientific, without any technology. And the West has chosen materialism. But man is very empty and meaningless. Without spirituality, there will be no center. Man is falling apart. The Western man is half. The Eastern man is half. My effort here is to create the whole man. Lofty goals, right? Here we go. Part one of the single most important sales pitch for a cult leader, a crucial sales pitch. If you want to become a cult leader, many others have come close, but everyone else is wrong. Only I understand all of the truth, the real truth. Part two of that is, and only I can share that truth with you. Rajneesh was proposing ideas counter to the core message of today's biggest world religions. Instead of the traditional practice of rejecting the world and rejecting all sexuality to achieve enlightenment, he proposed uh, embracing the world and embracing sexuality. He said, now there are two ways. Either repress sex as it has been done by all the so-called religious traditions of the world or transform it. I am for transformation. Hence, I teach my uh, saniacins to be creative. And that word, by the way, I have to say it a bunch of times today. Uh, uh, Saniacins. I can can never remember the emphasis, the syllabic emphasis. I tried practicing it so many times right before the show. So if there's one word you're going to question, probably going to be that one. And you're probably gonna be right. But anyway, I teach my uh, Sanitasins to be creative, create music, create poetry, create painting, create pottery, create something. Whatever you do, do it with great creativeness, bring something new into existence and your sex will be fulfilled on a higher plane. Uh, I don't know. I'm all for creativity. I'm all for sexual fulfillment. And I love sexual creativity. Uh, your body has so many delicious bundles of nerves waiting to be touched. Your brain engorges that tissue with blood, floods you with dopamines. Why not have as much fun with that pleasure system as you can? But I'm not sure there's a direct correlation between, say, making a fucking vase on your pottery wheel or painting some water lilies and really getting your fuck on. I'm pretty sure you cannot be artistically talented or at least, uh, you know, not with music, writing, painting, whatever, uh, but be really sexually charged and creative and fulfilled in bed. I think for some people, sex is their artistic medium. Hey, Lucifina. Uh, I think there's some truth in the gist of what he's saying. But the whole bring something new into your existence and your sex will be fulfilled on a higher plane. Is that some big wisdom nugget being fed to you on a path of enlightenment? Or is just that some cool cult leader shit to say? That doesn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, Bhagwan continued, we are materialist spiritualists. Nothing like this has ever happened in the world. Oh, fuck yeah, bro. You're the fucking first guy to figure it out. Uh, This is a new experiment, a new beginning, and it has a great future for it. Oh, God, he's a salesman. You have to be given a safe space from where you can work, a place where ordinary things, taboos, inhibitions are put aside. Mm, Some taboos are good, you know, uh, see exhibit uh, pedophilia. And And this is only the beginning. Many, many more are going to come. They are on the way. The others will come. The coming of millions more. Hence, your responsibility is great. Because you will be preparing the way. You're the chosen few. You got on the fucking train first. You get the best seats. This guy was good. Not going to lie. The message he's throwing out here sounds enticing. Rajneesh also had an interesting stance on women. Uh, Women were urged to be silent in the communes. Because according to Rajneesh, they could not think logically or scientifically. Yo, whoa, ha ha. Sales pitch a little harder on the ladies here. Uh, (laughs) What the fuck? Uh, there, there is uh, plenty of science that shows that men and women's brains are wired a bit different, but 
not logical or scientific, a massive number of female scientists, engineers, et cetera, literally embody how faulty that reasoning is. Not, not sounding terribly enlightened right there. Uh, Bhagwan further described women as infinitely patient beings who operate not from the head, but from the heart. That's still pretty patronizing. Uh, because of the womb being central phenomenon, being a central phenomenon in the feminine body, the whole psychology of a woman differs. She is non-aggressive, non-inquiring, non-questioning, non-doubting, because all those things are part of aggression. She will not take the initiative. She simply waits, and she can wait infinitely. I wonder what Bhagwan would think of women's MMA. There are for sure a shit ton of women in that sport who seem to have a fair amount of fucking aggression. Seem to have more aggression in them than I do. Uh, definitely a lot more aggression than his uh, old frail looking ass ever had. Now let's discuss their structure a bit. Uh, the structure of the cult was fairly simple. There was Rajneesh, the Bhagwan, meaning the blessed one. And then there were everyone beneath him, the disciples. Rajneesh's disciples were called uh, the Sannyasins. Right? That word I probably am fucking up. Uh, Sannyasin is a Hindu concept. People who renounce the world and practice asceticism. The denial of physical or psychological desires in order to attain a spiritual ideal or goal. Almost all religions contain elements of asceticism, but it seems most strongly associated with Hinduism. Ascetics abandon all claims to social or family standing. Rajneesh taught his disciples to live in the world without being attached to it. All his uh, Sannyasins took on new names as part of their quest for enlightenment. They dressed in orange, red, pink, and maroon clothing. Uh, the media often called Bhagwan's uh, Sannyasins Rajneeshis. The names are used interchangeably in sources. So who were some of the main Rajneeshis, the main figures of the cult? Well, Ma Anand Sheila was the face of the cult for many years. If you did watch that Netflix, uh, Netflix docuseries, Wild Wild Country, you certainly remember Sheila, easily the star of that show. Uh, she acted as Rajneesh's personal secretary and spokesperson when they were in Oregon. Uh, for a while, she had, you know, much more access to Bhagwan than anyone else. Deva Raj acted as Rajneesh's personal physician. Uh, Swami Prem Nirin acted as Rajneesh's personal lawyer, played a prominent role in the cult. Krishna Deva, mayor of the future city of Rajneesh Puram. Uh, Ma Prem Puja acted as the compound's nurse, operated the medical center, also maintained a stockpile of various deadly substances, as we'll learn. Ma Shanti Badra, a cult spokesperson, member of Sheila's inner circle. She ended up participating in several assassination plots. Because every series of cult, uh, cult has to have some assassins, right? Uh, Sassanians were assigned uh, different jobs based on their skill sets. Anyone who did not have valued skills, such as a lawyer, doctor, city planner, engineer, etc., was assigned more menial tasks. Those in Rajneesh's inner circle received preferential treatment. So there wasn't technically a second level, but there kind of was in practice. Uh, they, they had more access to the Bhagwan. Being in the inner circle was a, a highly coveted position within the cult. Only a select few could get and maintain their positions close to Rajneesh. So what were this cult's rules? The uh, Sassanians, the Rajneeshis, willing to do anything for their Bhagwan. The cult didn't have, um, they say they didn't have many rules, but uh, it seems like they kind of did. Because you had to do this work, you had to wear this outfit, you know. It seems like there was quite a few rules, actually. Uh, the, one, the rules they did have were strictly enforced. Uh, interesting rule, most interesting, I thought, was their skateboard rule. All Rajneeshis had to know how to kickflip which is interesting for some of the older members. Uh, you can watch on videos. Uh, if you couldn't kickflip on command and a Bhagwan would walk around his compound and demand it uh, randomly and often, you would be immediately exiled. Bhagwan, more than most things, he wanted you to fucking shred, bro. He was sponsored by both Vans Independent and actually Red Bull at one time before he was a cult leader. He was Tony fucking Hawk before there was a Tony Hawk. I wish. Wish that was true. Uh, that'd be fucking awesome. <laughs> Weird. Guru cult leader who just could fucking shred and wanted his followers to shred. No, uh, the dress code. That was a rule that was enforced. Uh, Sassanians had a strict dress code. They were required to wear clothing in shades of red, orange, pink, or maroon. Also had to wear a mala or beaded necklace with a picture of Rajneesh on it to show their dedication to their true cult leader. Funny, he often preached of uh, letting go of your ego, letting go of rules, but uh, his ego was so fucking huge, and one of his rules was you had to wear his picture. Pregnancy, uh, pregnancy, interestingly, forbidden in the cult. Rajneesh encouraged his followers to be surgically sterilized or have abortions. Rajneesh was against his followers having children, strongly. In an interview with the U.S. Immigration Naturalization Service on October 14th, 1982, he said, just as murder is considered by the society, so the birth of a child should be considered by the commune. All the top female officials were sterilized. Rajneesh encouraged all followers to do the same. Women who got pregnant were forced to have an abortion or leave the commune. No children were born on the cult's ranch in Oregon during their several years there. 
Now, is that because he uh, he believed that not having kids was the best for the planet, uh, best for the human race, best for enlightenment? I don't, I don't think he was that fucking stupid. I'm guessing he just did that because he knew it would promote harmony within the cult, right? A focus on parenting pulls away from a focus on the cult. And, you know, kids running around can really kill that kind of, uh, let's, let's explore our sexuality vibe. One former Sassan, uh, uh, Saniasen, I should just say Rajneeshi. One former Rajneeshi told New Republic in 2018, Bhagwan told his followers that a woman could not become enlightened if she had a child because it would take away from her vital energy. It took so much energy to become enlightened that if you had a child, you, could, you wouldn't have the energy to pursue that path. God, you need fucking energy for enlightenment. Everyone knows that. If having kids isn't compatible with the path of enlightenment, uh, I guess the, pl- the, the planet's pretty fucked, right? The path is pretty fucked there. Uh, what would the end game be with this philosophy? Just have everyone get enlightened then have a fully enlightened human, you know, uh, race be fully enlightened for, I don't know, a couple decades and everybody dies and there's no more humans because everybody stopped fucking. Uh, there were about 50 children on the Oregon ranch. They were all born before their parents joined the cult. Rajneesh enforced the fact that children belong to the commune, not their parents. Well, that's very culty, right? Children older than five would live apart from their parents in a special, special children's house. Can't distract your parents from the path of enlightenment, you dirty little fucking stupid rugrats. You stupid, un- unenlightened savages. Uh, although Rajneesh was very sex positive, in theory, real intensely intimate relationships were discouraged. All the Rajneeshis lived in crowded conditions, partially to discourage true intimacy. Commune authorities would break up men and women if they felt like they were developing strong feelings for one another. Everyone was encouraged to have sex with anyone who wanted to have sex with them. Saying no to anything sexual or not, was strongly discouraged, right? Just keep it casual. New Republic wrote in 2018, this depersonalization of sex and frustration of intimate relationships is simply designed to heighten the feeling of a personal connection with Bhagwan. Yeah, exactly. Enlightenment is mostly about remaining devoted to the cult leader, to the Bhagwan. This has obviously nothing to do with enlightenment, everything to do with control. Intense, dedicated, romantic love uh, is not a threat to enlightenment, it is a threat to Bhagwan devotion. So how was, all, how was all this shit funded? 100% through profits related to two hit American animated series and the merch sales related to those series. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh writing and coming up with character concept illustration under his birth name of Chandra Mohan Jain was a very gifted world builder. He wrote pilots for, illustrated the main characters of, and sold the concepts for both He-Man and the Thundercats franchises, uh, specifically to raise money for what he hoped would be a utopia in Oregon. He even voiced some of the characters for the first few seasons of each show. Uh, Moss Man, uh, Snout Sprout, Clamp Champ from He-Man, and uh, Tigra and Snarf from Thundercats. If he wouldn't have cared so much about being a guru, he could have built an empire around animated kids' cartoons uh, that might have rivaled Walt Disney's empires today, you know? In fact, before moving to the States, he was sometimes referred to in the press as the Indian Walt Disney. He, he, uh, he sold several successful animated series in the 70s to India uh, to fund, you know, cold activities there as well. And again, I wish. I wish he was a fucking skater die animated hero who just wanted to start a weird sex cult. No, they, no his cult was extremely well funded, but it wasn't built on cartoon money. Unfortunately, unlike many cult leaders, uh, he didn't want to isolate his community from society. He wanted them to be part of the marketplace. He was very pro-capitalism. He even said this commune is going to live and the only way for it to live is to be rich. They made money both legally and illegally. Rajneesh made money from selling books full of his enlightened ideas. He would sell millions of copies of his books around the world. Uh, Raj still sells them. Uh, Rajneesh also had meditation centers established all over the world full of followers living together in commune-like facilities, charging for meditation sessions. All communes were self-supporting, right? Had their own businesses on the side in addition to selling meditation sessions. They had construction companies, bistros, discos, maybe a skate park. I don't fucking know. Maybe an animation studio. It didn't say that, but it did not say that. Uh, In Oregon, the cult ran a meditation center with an isolation tank. The Rajneesh Investment Corp. uh, Corporation, yeah. Also owned the Zorba and Buddha nightclub and restaurant and the Zorba and, and the Zorba the Buddha bakery. They owned a hotel in downtown Portland called Hotel Rajneesh had numerous other real estate holdings. All in all, about 30,000 Rajneeshis were employed by Rajneesh's various business enterprise before it was all over. Well, before before it downsized, went back to India, because it's not all over. Uh, some of these businesses allegedly were covers for illegal operations. According to a 1980 article from the British Psychology Journal, Energy and Character, an ex-Rajneeshi named David Boadella wrote, at a well-known religious community in the East, 
Rajneeshis are selling their bodies on the open market to secure the money to gain a home for their souls in the spiritual community. This may take the form of earnings from masturbation shows or prostitution and is tacitly encouraged by the community in question, where the immoral earnings are discreetly referred to as getting sweets. Hmm, reminds me of the uh, David Berg, right? The, the children of God. Uh, the same community, there is an official policy that actively discourages or prohibits drug taking. Unofficially, however, an active drug run organization or an active drug run organized by Rajneeshis flourishes with or alongside the community and people in need of money to buy a place in the community are put in touch with covertly by high ranking officials there. Five or six kilos of cannabis are secreted in false bottom suitcases and are smuggled by plane via Amsterdam and Paris to Montreal, where they are sold for approximately $20,000. The drug ring collects approximately $13,000, and the person who smuggles the drugs collects approximately $6,500 towards his tickets to heaven. Several Rajneeshis are currently serving jail sentences for participating in drug runs. Two of them use brainwashing as a defense of their trials in order to gain a reduced sentence. Chief Inspector of the Puna Police over in India also noted that prostitution by this cult's girl disciples reached di- disgraceful proportions. It became epidemic. So, hmm, interesting take on the sex positivity there. All right, and I, uh, I have no qualms with uh, sex work, but uh, when you're pimping out your members for sex work and taking the money, that's pretty fucking gross for your cult. Uh, questions about Rajneeshi prostitution rings uh, came up frequently when Bhagwan or Sheila would be interviewed by the press. Slang and sex for enlightenment. That's that's the path. Cult, cult, cult. Uh, Rajneesh also made a significant amount of money, arguably much more than he made from any of his businesses from the generous, uh, generous donations from his followers. Uh, I've not been able to find any kind of revenue breakdown for this cult. I doubt one was ever made public if it existed in the first place. But I have to imagine this was far and away the cult's primary source of income, right? especially in the Oregon days. His followers, many of them affluent, loved him tremendously, you know, willingly put millions and millions into his pockets and into the cult's businesses. Will signed over, right, to the cult's business enterprises, family fortune signed over, all for a taste that sweet, sweet enlightenment. Rajneesh was so wealthy that he eventually owned a fleet of 93 Rolls Royces. Had 93 Rolls Royces. Luxury clothing. So many Rolex watches. They don't know how many. Properties all over the world, you know, and millions to spare. Like tens of millions. Of course, he didn't keep the money personally, so he could, you know, claim poverty. He ran everything through various, you know, uh, organizations, kind of like tax shelters, it seemed, various, you know, businesses under LLCs or under some kind of corporation. Heading, uh, some of which we'll learn about in the timeline. Now let's look at what what daily life is like, was like during this uh, time we're going to cover today as a Rajneeshi. Life on the Oregon Ranch was a little different than life was back at the uh, Rajneeshi ashrams in India before the Oregon Ranch. In Oregon, the Rajneeshis worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, doing hard labor. Right, keep people tired, keep them confused. Don't let them think too much about how fucking weird it is what you're doing. Uh, You know that didn't leave enough time for, uh, or as much time for orgies and meditation as some of them had grown used to back in India. Several former Rajneeshis spoke with the cut on what daily life was like at the ranch. Rashid Maxwell said, "Because of my agricultural experience, I was one of the first people to go to Rajneesh Puram. My job was taking the land which had been totally neglected and overgrazed and getting the basics of agriculture started." Very soon after that, I had many disagreements with Sheila, never got on with her. Didn't feel to me like she was intelligent even. She was cunning, clever, but not intelligent. The arguments were about policy. She said we should have chickens because we'd need lots of eggs. And I said, yeah, we should have them scattered all all around. And she said, no, put them all together. And I said, well, then you have the likelihood of disease and you need to give them antibiotics. And she said, so give them antibiotics. And that was really not my way. I was an organic farmer. And there were more profound disagreements. Like I did not, uh, like I did have contact with the Nike shoes guy in the documentary, this is we'll talk talk about him later, rancher Bill Bowerman. I had a uh, very nice contact with him. I went over to his ranch. We talked about growing grapes, having a vineyard. He taught me how to roll cigarettes, one handed on a horse. I couldn't and wouldn't go along with Sheila's aggression towards the neighbors. So within another three months, I was out of farming and gardening and in the pot room washing pots. I was very unhappy in the pot room because I felt like my dream of an, of an environmental paradise was just lost. And she handed it over to someone who would be more obedient to her wishes. I didn't like or trust Sheila, but none of us had any clue what was really going on. The poisonings, the firebombing, it was inconceivable to me. After it all came out, we were just sort of wandering in shock for days. I just remember walking down one of the roads, not knowing what I was doing. What, where am I? Former member Hira Bluestone said, for my whole life, people have been asking me what it was like. And just like if you ask anybody what their childhood was like, it had pluses and minuses. 
I had a tremendous amount of freedom and responsibility and opportunity to learn things. Like I was a mechanic on airplanes when I was nine years old. At the same time, it was an oppressive culture. There was, a lo- there was not a lot of school or formal education. There were times when we had school, but the school moved around and had sort of a rotating cast of characters and was sort of optional. And that was something I really wanted. And then Ma Ananda Sarita said, I was there with the first 20 people before Osho came to the ranch and Osho is Bhagwan. And then I was there until there were only six people left. It was a super positive time in my life. We took a desert, we completely transformed it in only five years, turned it into an oasis. People were working 16 hour days, but always singing, dancing, hugging, laughing, having love affairs. Eh, If you're working 16 hours a day, does it really leave a lot of time for the rest of that stuff? Uh, It was very vibrant and alive. Uh, It was a very vibrant and alive place and very joyful. Most of the people who were there had no idea about the crimes that were being committed by Sheila and her close entourage. I will say watching a few different documentaries on all this, uh, they did build an amazing place in many ways in a very short amount of time. In just a few years, the ranch was transformed from an empty rural property into a small city of at least 7,000 people, complete with typical urban infrastructure such as the fire department, police, uh, restaurants, had a fucking mall. Uh, two-story mall, townhouses, 4,200-foot uh, airstrip, public transport system using a lot of buses, uh, sewage reclamation plant, reservoir, even a post office with a zip code. As far as cold compounds go, this place was even more developed than Dwight York's Nuwabian Nation of Moors cult, uh, rural Putnam County, Georgia, weird-ass fucking Egyptian-themed pyramid and disco complex compound, Tom Ray. That place was pretty developed. They even had their own compound currency. But Dwight didn't build a self-sustaining city quite like uh, Bogwan's minions did. Former member Amito Goodnight said, my time at the ranch was completely not involved with any of the overall administration. I was just working and being with friends. I really was not very aware of the darkness until after it was very, very close to the end. But there was one thing I had to do that I had difficulty doing. I was one of the people who went out to invite homeless people to come back to the ranch. I was asked by somebody in an office in Oregon to ask two people to leave the bus when we were partway on our journey back to Oregon. They were two people that I felt were very, very vulnerable and I felt very uncomfortable dropping them off away from home. I called several times to see if I could get a different answer, but they were very insistent I do it. So eventually I did. Why were there busing homeless people around? Uh, You'll see in the timeline. It had nothing to do with enlightenment. They were using Oregon residents to try and steal an election. Actually, they were using US residents, not necessarily from Oregon, to try and steal an election, giving people food and a place to crash, uh, you know, in exchange for their vote. We'll, we'll, We'll explore that more. Uh, former member Saran, oh, Surindra, Surindra recalled the following about her time in the cult saying the share a home thing was quite something. I was building fences at the time. And then I suddenly got given a few people who were on the share a home program. And I was really frustrated because they were unfocused. They weren't working. And I complained to one of the bosses. We always had female bosses. Oh, put women in charge of everything. And she said, look, it's not about production. This is about connecting and sharing our commune and sharing what we feel. I ended up with two guys and we really created a friendship between us. I can still see their faces and their gradual sort of relaxation. They were in a safe place. There was no crime. No one was going to beat them up. They had a place to sleep, good food, and work to do. We were all a bunch of kids in a way, wanting to get a hold of our tools and go out and dig holes and put out fences. Like young children have that energy, we had that energy. But I think there was a sort of blinkered attitude. We were a bit too much like placeful kids and not aware of what was going on in the commune as a whole. Uh, Surindra, some of the others... uh, you know, alluded to some problems they should have been aware with uh, or aware of, you know, within the cult. Let's talk about, talk about some of the problems in this cult before jumping into the timeline. As nice as some of the free love enlightenment teachings of Rajneesh might sound on the surface, you know, the reality of, of the cult was very different in many cases. There was definitely a dark underbelly. Some of the encounter groups were disturbingly violent, uh, sexually and psychologically abusive to followers. In a 1978 issue of the German magazine Stern, a woman named Eva Renzi, recounted her horrific experience in a Rajneeshi encounter group. One of many to report similar, how the fuck do you rationalize this kind of experience? Uh, She said, in the room were 18 people. I only knew Jan, a 50-year-old Dutchman. The leader sat down after he had closed the thick, soundproof door. Suddenly a woman hurled herself at another and screamed at her, you make me sick. You're a vampire. I want to scratch your face, you filthy thing. She beat her. Meanwhile, two women and a young man had got up. The young man threw himself on a girl of about 18, boxed her on the ears with the words, you're a caricature of Madonna. You think you're better than us, don't you? You're the worst person here. And then pointed to me, he said, together with you, you bitch, you've got it coming too. The girl's nose was running with blood. She tried desperately to protect herself against the blows. Then the leader took charge saying, you probably think you have to, you probably think that you have control over things. 
You have not even got control over yourself. You are under total control here. Huh, what a what a curious path of enlightenment. Who knew the path included men throwing women to the ground and hitting them in the fucking head and face? That seems a wee bit unnecessary. Uh, Renzi was then assigned to spend the night with Jan, right? To bunk up with this fucking random dude. Uh, and, and instead, uh, she decided to uh, go to sleep after dinner, right? Because by spend the night uh, assigned to basically like, you know, go have sex with him. So she does not. And then she says, the next day I appeared for the group punctually. I said a friendly good morning. I see silence answered me. I sat down. The leader asked what had happened in the previous 24 hours. Jan sprang up, pulled me up, began uninhibitedly beating me. He shouted, you whore. You have humiliated me. You cursed woman. I'll kill you. I was horrified. My nose began to bleed. I shouted, this is your problem. Your masculine pride is hurt. He beat me further. He tore my blouse, threw me on the floor. Uh, Like someone possessed, he sat on me, beat me with his fists on my head, choked my neck, shouted, say the truth, you piece of filth. I said, what truth? Are you out of your mind? You're hypnotized. Suddenly he left me. I got up trembling, trying to stop the bleeding nose. Is this a center for developing crazy masculinity? I asked. I thought the craziness had passed and would go. uh, Then, first of all, a man dived on me. Exactly that. He said, what do you think we're doing here? Then two women grabbed me. Then the whole group. What happened next was like an evil dream. Fight with us, you coward. Will you play holy in here, you whore? Someone said. I fled from one corner to another. They punched, scratched, kicked me, pulled my hair. They tore my blouse, pants off my body. I was stark naked. And they were so surrendered to the madness that I was filled with death anxiety. My one thought to stay conscious. I screamed, let me go. I want to get out of here. At a signal from the leader, they let me go. This crazy, uh, this craziness garnished with sadism, this fanaticism with world beating claims. Had I not already heard it somewhere before? She said, what the fuck? Uh, There's worse accounts. Uh, The Netflix documentary, Wild Wild Country, as good as it was in many ways, really overlooked this aspect of Bogwan's, you know, philosophy, in my opinion. Uh, They framed sexuality in the cult as being kind of something in the vein of, you know, hippie free love. And sometimes it was, oftentimes it was. But then other times behind closed doors, according to so many allegations you can find all over the web, there were a lot of sexual assaults and rapes happening disguised as some kind of fucked up experimental, you know, therapy. There were also so many women brainwashed into thinking that denying male cult members sexual uh, sexual or sexuality was wrong and selfish. You know, they were trained to basically allow themselves to be raped. Uh, Look around the edges a bit, and this cult is a lot darker than the docuseries made them seem. It wasn't uh, all free love. A lot of of heavily coerced, just let everyone fuck you, you know, uh, madness disguised as free love. When Dick Price, an Esalen Institute founder, uh, visited the commune in Oregon, he was not impressed with Bhagwan's teachings at all. He was concerned. He found that the dynamic meditation techniques that were being used had fuck all to do with enlightenment or the humanistic movement, right? He felt that they were intentionally being conducted in ways to harm, to abuse and control members of the community. He was appalled by the psychological and physical violence present in encounter groups. Josh Barron, who ran a support group in Berkeley for people who left spiritual groups, told the New Republic, Rajneesh is quite fluent in various altered states of consciousness, much more than any other cult leaders I know of. His techniques include chanting, meditation, Sufi dancing, staring into lights for extended periods of time, and powerful music, all of which induce altered states of mind. What went on at his ashram in Pune was literally a smorgasbord of altered states of mind, right? Altered states of consciousness, uh, like what I touched on earlier. He knew how to sell his followers the feelings of being on certain drugs without giving them drugs. If only those people knew that you could just achieve that same level of enlightenment or maybe more of it from the right amount of psilocybin or ecstasy or maybe, you know, a couple hits of uh, 5-MeO-DMT, smoke in the right atmosphere, you can fast pass all the meditation, shoot straight to the head of the enlightenment line. No cold compound, no rapey encounter groups necessary to experience, uh, you know, uh, a for- euphoria and self-discovery. Just maybe read the right books, do the right drugs in the right setting. Uh, Hilly Zitlin, clinical social worker, co-director of Options for Personal Transitions at Berkeley, an organization dealing with cult involvement and related issues. Also spoke to New Republic about this cult. Uh, Zietlin, Zietlin or Zietlin, I think it's Zietlin, called Rajneesh one of the best hypnotists I've ever encountered. The way he uses language, his tone of voice, the way he sequences ideas, all are essentially hypnotic. The art of hypnosis is the art of being vague while pretending you are being profound. Rajneesh can be even vaguer now by not saying anything at all because he's referring to a period of silence he went through. Uh, yeah, yeah, fucking nailed it. I feel like a large part of the art of playing the part of the enlightened mystic is the art of being vague while pretending you are being very profound, sounding profound, but not really saying anything. Over on The Secret Suck, the Patreon companion podcast of Time Suck, we have covered uh, so many minor league, not quite cult leaders, wackadoodles, 
with huge followings online who are so good at being vague while pretending to be profound, right? Just masters of word salad. So good at taking a very long time to string together a lot of cool sound of words that when you stand back and look at them all together, uh, they don't mean fucking shit. Catherine McLaughlin, associate professor of religious studies at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, attended University of Pune from 1977 to 1978 and actually went to hear one of Rajneesh's local lectures. She said his use of language is wonderful. He is a hypnotic and beautiful speaker who is profoundly psychically connected to his audience. We have an immature understanding of spirituality in the West. And since we don't believe in psychic phenomena, we are very vulnerable to them. In India, it is understood that anybody who meditates can develop psychic powers. The notion is commonly held that there are such powers and that you can develop them if you want to. McLaughlin said that Western academically trained intellectuals are especially vulnerable to this because they've been trained to use their heads, but not their emotions. And these techniques bypass rational thought. I mean, I wish I could follow up with her. I would love to uh, ask her exactly what she meant by psychic phenomena here. Uh, Traditionally, it's defined as phenomena that appears to contradict physical laws and suggest the possibility of causation by mental processes. As an associate professor of religious studies, I'm guessing Kathleen uh, more open to the possibility of the supernatural or the paranormal than say a non-religious scientist. As much as I want to believe in psychic phenomena, uh, no one has ever been able to demonstrate in a lab to replicate the ability to, say, read people's minds or move something with their mind or view the future or, you know, uh, view what's happening in, a, in another place in the world that you're not physically located in real time without the aid of technology, etc. T- to me, it's, it almost sounds like she makes Bhagwan sound like, like, a, like a fucking dark wizard using black magic to hypnotize followers. And I don't think that's what he did. I bet he was like the guru equivalent of a really good magician, though. I mean, a really good magician, I think, can make you, at least with me and a lot of people I know, can make you truly wonder if that fucker is actually using magic to pull off tricks because your mind just can't explain it any other way. But it is always just a trick, an optical illusion. I bet Bhagwan was so skilled in verbal manipulation. He could combine, you know, uh, eye contact uh, as well, vocal cadence, the right combo of important sounding words and spiritual concepts to truly sort of hypnotize followers into believing him. Scary and dangerous talent. He did have a very hypnotic way of speaking that we'll look into in a bit here. Uh, I guess in a way, a, a sort of magic. Actually, let's, let's look at it now. Check out this little clip of him talking. So deliberate, so contrived. I mean, he sounds like someone that you would cast a, as a literal fucking snake charmer some villain in in some movie you have no philosophy of life (laughs) no philosophy of life i have life itself there are people who have philosophies of life but they don't have any life your philosophy if there is one has been expressed in the three l's love life laughter Is that a philosophy of life? No. What, could you explain that? It is just a consequence of being silent and in tune with existence. Love arises in you. Life becomes abundant. (laughs) Laughter for no reason. Just because this whole existence is so hilarious, <laughs> this is not philosophy, this is the consequence of being silent. God, his speech is so affected. Just be silent, everyone, that's all it is. Wow, the way he talks fucking kills me. That's, that's, and that's not a normal accent, is it? The way he drags out that sound at the end of so many senses. Is anyone not trying to sound like a guru actually fucking talk like that? He speaks so unnaturally slowly, and when you see him do this, he almost never breaks eye contact with who he's speaking with, giving his speeches a a hint of aggression, in my mind, and and almost never fucking blinks. It's very weird, very unnatural. There's nothing natural about the way he talked. All for effect, in my opinion. Uh, Listen to responses he gives an interviewer for Australia's 60 Minutes, where a bunch of his followers are in the room, the over, over-the-top over reactions of his group, so reeking on just unnatural devotion to their cult leader. I mean, they, they do actually seem hypnotized. It's so ridiculous. We're going to jump in on him uh, responding to former devotee Sheila, accusing him of being on sedatives most of the time at the uh, Oregon compound. And can you see in my eyes 
that they are drugged? Are you... An honest answer? Yeah. I often wondered what was in your eyes. Yeah, in my eyes there is something, but it is not drugs. <laughs> it can drug you. Hilarious! <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> you can drug you? <laughs> Come on! Cue the applause break sign. Oh, boy. And again, dragging out that fucking hiss. I just hate it so much. Do you know how many snakes live in all the world's jungles? The number does not matter for enlightened persons. All that matters is that you are not one of the snakes. Fucking kills me. Uh, Zetland further added, there was an intense effort to break down normal ways by which people measure themselves under the guise of going beyond or transcending the ego. And all this is done in, hyp in a hypnotically binding way. They overload the circuits of the conscious mind, then present you with the alternative of inner consciousness. Meanwhile, dependence on the group has developed. ex Rajneeshis were described as extremely psychologically regressed. Their capacity to relate to others or articulate their feelings was drastically reduced. He never enlightened them. He, he did kind of hypnotize them. He sold them this fucking fairy tale. And then when the fairy tale came to an end and everyone had to return to the real world, they were less prepared to handle it than they were when they'd first joined his cult because they were living in such an unnatural way with such unnatural focus on this guru. Some guru. Uh, Margot Gordon from Britain and Maria Christina Koppel from Sweden would try and expose that the cult was not a positive influence in their lives when they were tried in court in India for running drugs, allegedly on behalf of the cult. They'd use, uh, they'd use brainwashing as a defense of their trials. Koppel's attorney, Mr. W. Taylor, said, my extensive, my extensive inquiries show that the man out in Pune, called Bhagwan, is nothing short of an evil man. Using a lot of young people and reducing their mentality to such a position, it becomes no more and no less than putty in his hands. He does it all for money, and he uses these girls as a front for smuggling drugs all over the world. Over a period of time, these young women or young men have their personalities reduced to nothing. Their past is forgotten. And suggestions are put to them, and they would do anything that the man tells them to do. Tater called on Professor Johann uh, Agard, an expert on Hinduism and Eastern religions who researched the Rajneeshis, and he testified in Pune, Bhagwan and his people, not least his group of high ranking officers, have established an alternative world. He gives them a mala with his own picture on it, and they get a piece of his hair connecting their reality with his. From the beginning, the aim is to do away with the mind, the personality, the memory. You end up being nobody. You have to give up your ego. You have to empty yourself totally to surrender to Bhagwan. Total surrender are the key words. This is done by a series of humiliating acts where you are forced to do what you hate to do in the group. You lose the identity feeling, which is connected with certain acts, certain reservations, certain sexual inhibitions. In a number of those workshops, promiscuity takes place in the most rude and horrible ways. Male persons are allowed to do whatever they like with females and vice versa. And it aims at bringing down the consciousness connected with the individual in order that a new consciousness connected with Bhagwan and his ideology takes its place. Jesus, right? Some of those workshops, again, they just sound more like fucking gang rape than therapy. All for enlightenment. Christina's lawyers argued that she was psychologically coerced into smuggling cannabis. She had been subjected to, a, to three two-hour long sessions in a sensory deprivation tank and described that as a Nazi-style torture device designed to brainwash victims. Christina's mother also wrote a letter to the court saying Christina was commanded to have sexual intercourse with every man in the group in turn in order to, quote, kill her ego. The group leader, a woman, shouted at her, if you are to surrender to Bhagwan, you must surrender to anybody here, to any man, although the mere thought of it makes you sick. You are not to think. Just let it happen. Yee! If that isn't straight up to sexual assault or abuse, it, it sure is knocking on the fucking door. It's definitely emotional abuse, strongly pressuring someone to allow themselves to be sexually abused. Rajneesh and some of his minions definitely use sex to manipulate followers. Rosalind, an ex-disciple, lived at an ashram in Pune for six months, and she said that women were psychologically pressured to participate in sexual acts and orgies. The lingo with the ashram was say yes, say yes to life. One guy made an approach to me. I wasn't the least bit interested, but I felt guilty because I was not saying yes to life. Women who refused to participate in sexual acts were social outcasts, labeled selfish, frigid, rejecting. Eckhart, another ex-disciple, witnessed the rape of a female disciple by two men during an encounter group called Surrender. He said he tried to intervene, but the group leader stopped him, told him verbatim she needed 
to be raped. Uh, and again, I am so constantly amazed, so continually amazed that more of these motherfuckers are not murdered. Either one of my kids gets sucked into some weird shit like this, I will happily risk dying in prison to have the satisfaction of knowing that I personally, personally removed uh, a cult leader or some high-ranking fucking dirtbag member from the face of the fucking earth. Ah, oh, fuck that seminar leader. Uh, because of all the sex, STDs were rampant at the Puna Ashram. Rosalind described a tremendous gonorrhea outbreak. One man infected 10 women during a week-long tantra group. Uh, doctors began to carefully screen new arrivals for STDs. People were given uh, the all clear and then posted, uh, they had their name posted on a bulletin board. Followers gathered, chose partners for the night. New arrivals had to wear an orange bead on their locket until they passed STD tests. Man, behind all the singing and chanting and robes and talk of enlightenment, a lot of darkness with the Rajneeshis. Uh, Rajneesh's teachings weren't as kind and loving as they first appeared. According to Krishna Deva, ex-mayor of the Oregon compound, Rajneesh was comparing himself to Hitler towards the end of the cult's time in Oregon. Said that Hitler was also uh, misunderstood when he sought to create a new man. In his book, The Mustard Seed, Rajneesh attempted to justify the Holocaust on the grounds that Jewish people killed Jesus. Oh, boy. Uh, Because of a lot of shit like this, Rajneesh's uh, legitimacy as a spiritual leader has often been called into question by his peers. Right? No surprises there. Uh, but also, is anyone really qualified, quote unquote, to be a spiritual leader? I mean, ultimately, if what you're teaching people to worship or believe in doesn't have any factual or, you know, able to be proven basis, uh, does it really matter how many courses you've taken, how many years you've studied? I, I can study unicorns for years. I can read literally every book ever written about unicorns. Would that suddenly make them real? Would it make me a unicorn expert? Is being a unicorn expert the equivalent of being an expert chemist or medieval era historian? No. That being said, I was curious what others in the religious community, those who looked into Bhagwan's place in the theological world, what they thought of his religious accreditation. In April 1983, Portland physician James Perkins, who was involved in the litigation with the Rajneesh Foundation and the American Consulate in Bombay, wrote, according to our information, the Rajneesh Foundation in India at no time claimed itself as a religion, nor was its leader, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, ever known uh, as a founder of a religion. Well, he was for tax purposes. We'll get into that later. Uh, Kathleen McLaughlin confirmed that Bhagwan was not accepted as a religious teacher in India. One of the things that's clear, she said, is that if someone is an enlightened master, he doesn't go around spreading dissent and hatred. The way Rajneesh and his followers antagonized people in India inevitably, inevitably meant that he was not regarded as an enlightened person. Rajneesh taking on the title of Bhagwan, which means Lord or God, also uh, blasphemous in many circles. It's not blasphemous if your followers give you the title, but is blasphemous to call yourself Bhagwan as he did. Rajneesh calling his followers uh, Sannyasins, uh, also disrespectful to Hinduism. Traditionally, Sannyasins uh, mean, uh, you know, it means, uh, you know, people give up worldly possessions and take up sacred vows. His disciples didn't do that. But what he's doing here, nothing new, right? Cults almost always, uh, you know, base themselves in their lingo in one of the old world religions. We looked at so many that have branched out from Christianity. You know, they use language and concepts familiar to the adherents of a particular faith, makes their messages not seem so foreign. They dish out helpings of, uh, you know, verbal or written equivalent of comfort food to people, then pivot, pull them away from that faith that they're, you know, basing themselves in by pointing out how wrong or corrupt that faith is and then drag them in a slightly new direction that ends up being an extremely new direction. Bhagwan grew up surrounded by Hinduism and his family practiced Jainism. Jainism, a completely separate religion from Hinduism, but both religions share certain concepts, terms, and Bhagwan took what was around him, tweaked it into making something he could call his own. McLaughlin also found that his promotion of unrestrained sexual indulgence and promiscuity was offensive to the traditional practice of Hindu Tantra, a practice thought to have strongly influenced some of Bhagwan's notions of sacred sexuality. McLaughlin said the Tantra is a very disciplined path of spirituality, and if there is anything Rajneesh does not teach, it is discipline. Tantric sexual practice is non-orgasmic. It's not just going out and sleeping around. You have a partner chosen by your teacher, and it can be years before you have any sexual contact with that partner at all. It's not a one-night stand. Rajneesh's organization uh, never uh, even claimed to be a religion until the Immigration Naturalization Service began contemplating deport, uh, deportation. On December 5th, 1952, Ma Anand Sheila announced to the meditation centers across the world, a new religion has been born called Rajneeshism. One additional problem with the cult was child abuse and neglect. Two adults reported to New Republic that they saw kids running around the Oregon ranch in winter without proper clothes. Another witness saw a kid playing outside naked in December. It's a cold ass area. Uh, accidents were common because of lack of supervision. One witness recounted an accident of a two year old, saying the first accident he had was when he fell down a stairway, banged himself up badly. The next I can remember, he was run over by a pickup. 
Poor little thing, one side of his face, nothing but blood and pus and swollen and bruised. It was terrible. The only thing that saved him was the mud was so deep. He was out there amid the machinery all the time. It's a wonder he didn't get killed. Uh, Rosalind, a former cult member, said, the children are discouraged from living with their parents. They have one of the lowest priorities of any concern. They're given very little attention. That doesn't sound very enlightened. Rosalind also reported that children and young teenagers uh, involved in sexual activities at the ranch. Most of the 12, 13, 14-year-old girls at the ranch were having sexual relationships, she said. It was a common thing. Ah, also doesn't seem too enlightened. Uh, According to a 1983 report by the Concerned Christian Growth Ministries of Australia, an Australian visitor to the Oregon ranch reported the ranch house has been converted. The ranch house has been converted to the children's house and schoolroom. Children do not have to live with their parents; they belong to the community. And pride is exuded in the modern approach, quote unquote, used in their upbringing. Some children were running around naked in the schoolhouse, and it is not unusual for boys and girls to sleep together. Children are encouraged to experiment sexually with one another. And one uh, Rajneeshi said, children often watch their parents' sexual involvement in private, of course. A uh, girl who lived on the ranch from age 11 to 13 reported that girls her age often had sexual relationships with older men. Girls as young as 10 had sexual relationships with adult men. Former homeless people who were brought in uh, by the cult confirmed this to Oregon Magazine. They saw boys and girls engaging in relationships with adults and the children's parents knew about it and didn't do anything. So free love, getting a little, getting a little too free with the Rajneeshis. Maybe just maybe want to fucking rein that in a bit. Maybe that kid's brains develop a bit more but they, before they decide, you know, uh, uh, what they want to have put in, th- in their holes or what holes they want to stick their shit into. Maybe don't let free love slide into uh, overt pedophilia and blatant sexual exploitation. Bhagwan wanted to break uh, too many of the old uh, taboos, too many of the rules. Noah Maxwell spent a good part of his childhood growing up in one of, the, uh, one of Bhagwan's compounds. He spoke to the Guardian about his experience growing up in the cult. The family was upper middle class, disillusioned with life in London. They purchased a farm, learned to live off the land. Then in 1976, they got a letter from a friend who said they had found the meaning of everything. Probably want to burn that letter. Friend sounds crazy. Uh, The family went to the ashram in India to uh, see it for themselves. They were instantly enchanted, sold their farm, moved to India. Family gave up their identities to join the cult. Noah was renamed Swami Deva Rupam. Noah's parents were separated into different housing uh, units. He lived in the children's huts. We had been a tight 70s middle-class family. And within a very short period of time, that family unit was ripped up. Noah lived in an octagonal bamboo hut with kids from all over the world. They attended a school. Uh, here, here's this quote run by this crazy English hippie called Sharma with long blonde hair and a guitar. And we would sing. We all live in the orange submarine. <laughs> ah, sounds like a fucking parody of a cult. Uh, I don't know how much it mattered if we were in school or not. When I eventually did get back to this country, when I was 10, I couldn't read anything or write anything or do two plus two. I mean, not, not a very great, very good school. Uh, no witness Rajneesh's hypnotic influence. He saw people burst into hysterical laughter. One night, thousands of people laughed at the same time and then began crying. He also heard people having sex all the time. He said, you could hear people having orgasmic sex all the time, all night, like mating baboons, gibbons. Noah was told to never show if he was feeling upset. He said that the narrative, particularly from my dad was, this is fantastic. You're fantastic. No one, the other kids ran wild around the ashram. They drank, smoked weed, caught snakes, barely attended school. Eventually, Noah's parents split up. His mom was going back to England. Dad was going to stay in Oregon. When Noah's mom moved out of the cult, she asked if uh, he wanted to stay in England or, uh, you know, or wanted to come to England or stay with his father. And he, uh, he told her, I want to stay and go to school and learn things. Oh, sorry. He, he, so I guess he like visiting. He wanted to go to England. I don't know why that phrase was phrasing was confusing to me. Enlightenment be damned. He wanted to actually learn shit that would help him pay bills when he got older. Uh, before heading to Oregon, Rajneesh's teachings got him into several conflicts with the Indian government. If shit would have worked out better in India, he never would have had to find a new place in Oregon. Then the place he chose, if he was truly enlightened, he would have been smart enough to know his efforts were doomed from the very beginning. Out of out of possible West Coast destinations, it was really fucking dumb for them to pick uh, rural Central Oregon. He should have picked Central California, a place more used to and tolerant of extreme religious ideas, or maybe rural Southern Nevada. Beyond an area where prostitution is legal, there's more of a vibe of stay out of my business. I'll stay out of your business. Even Western Washington would have been way better, right? Somewhere west of the Cascades, probably around Olympia, maybe near Yelm, where they already have a cult compound. Rom- Rompthus School of Enlightenment, been there since 1988. That school's enlightened teachings are based on uh, channeling sessions. Old Jay-Z Knight, and her compound. This fucking insane American white woman who claims to channel a 35,000-year-old Indian being called Romtha the Enlightened One. This bean speaks to her in a fucking shitty Indian accent. Fuckers had 35,000 years to shake that accent. He still can't do it. 
Uh, people pay her for enlightenment as well. Bhagwan should have done his homework a little bit, understood the political microclimates of the West uh, a little bit better before moving across the Pacific. People in the vicinity of Olympia, way more left than people in rural central Oregon, way more likely to let their spirituality freak flag fly. Antelope, Oregon was and is small town, half half ghost town, really, uh, you know, inhabited by primarily conservative white older people, even more conservative back in 81 than it is now. Anyone practicing religion in that area in 1981, 99.9% chance it was traditional Christianity. The other 0.1%, well, if they were practicing something different, they kept that shit to themselves to avoid constant uh, judgmental stink eyes from their neighbors. This is an area loaded to the gills with God-fearing, gun-owning, bleed red, white, and blue Americans. You'd have to be a fucking fool to think you could try and build a massive, your religion is fucking stupid, sex cult enlightenment compound and not have that be interpreted as a declaration of war. Rajneesh and his followers moved uh, onto a 64,000 acre, 100 square mile ranch in central Oregon anyways. Rancho Rajneesh. And right away, the Rajneeshes began to build their own city called Rajneesh Puram. They tried for four years to establish a permanent settlement in the Oregon desert, a country inside another country, really. They almost pulled it off. When the Rajneeshes arrived, it fell to locals as if fucking aliens had literally landed in Antelope. Right? The residents wondered who these new people were, what they wanted, how long they'd stay, just exactly uh, who they were worshiping. The Rajneeshis said they just wanted to farm the land, follow their religion, be good neighbors. But that's not true. They wanted to take over the area and leave the locals two options, assimilate or relocate. Soon, the small Antelope City Council began a years-long battle to shut down the Rajneeshi community, claiming it violated Oregon land use laws, which it did. But the Rajneeshis, they would win an initial court battle. And they would uh, build a lot more, uh, build a lot further than I think a lot of people expected. Uh, the two groups soon engage in a political and sometimes violent war with each other. Rajneeshis, led by Rajneesh's personal secretary, right, Ma Anand Sheila, would end up attempting to assassinate people, commit voter fraud, arson, wiretapping, even a bioterror attack before everything began to fall apart in 1985. Commune leaders were eventually forced to flee the country to avoid prosecution. It's an exciting tale. Let's dig into the details of how this all evolved with today's Time Suck timeline strap on those boots soldier we're marching down a time suck timeline december 11th 1931 bhagwan Sri rajneesh is born the future cult leader comes from humble beginnings he's actually born uh chandra mohan jain in the small village of kuchwada india population there hovers around 2000 oldest of his parents 11 kids uh, later, cult folklore reported that Rajneesh actually had appeared on Earth seven years earlier, right? Before his, uh, uh, before his, he was born in the body that his followers would recognize. Of course he did. You can't just be a fucking normal dude who talks super slow and says shit that sounds enlightened at first, but then on further reflection, you realize he said a whole lot of nothing. No, you gotta be some quasi-immortal Highlander motherfucker. He was a mystic who was murdered three days before ending a 21-day fast in his first incarnation. It would have ended in enlightenment. But he got fucking murdered. Rajneesh later described his uh, first life as, uh, or his new life as a continuation of this past life. Mm-hmm. Rajneesh lived with his grandparents in his uh, early childhood, then moved back in with his parents several years later. The Awakened One, a biography by Vasant Joshi, claimed that Rajneesh lived in Kujwada uh, with his grandparents until the age of seven. Those who knew Rajneesh described him as an intelligent but rebellious child. Rajneesh's paternal uncle, uh, Shikacharand, or... Uh, Sikar, Sikarchand Jain, a.k.a. Anand Siddharth, uh, described him as a brilliant student and intelligent student. He read all the books in the library he was fond of learning. Siddharth uh, owned a cloth shop in uh, Gadawara, India. And, uh, sorry, I scrolled too far there. Uh, Gadawara, a grain marketing town of about 45,000 people. Rajneesh's parents, Bubalal and uh, Saraswati by Bubalal Jain. And their growing family lived in a row of storefront houses in a commercial area. Rajneesh's father worked in the cloth shop with Siddharth. And Rajneesh said of his childhood, my house was a guest house of many Jaina saints, Hindu monks, Sufi mystics. Because my grandfather was interested in all those people. But he was not a follower of anybody. He rather enjoyed me bothering these saints. Eh, did that happen? Did all those people really visit his grandfather's house? Or is that some more myth building? I have a hard time trusting someone who in intentionally hisses all the time while never breaking eye, eye contact like a Fucking weird, evil magician. Uh, young Rajneesh was described as a willful child who was glib beyond his years. He attended primary school and high school in Garawara. He learned English at a young age, known for spending hours in the public library. 
Also figured out how to give a good speech early in life. Childhood friend S.R. Parat uh, told the Oregonian he was a very good orator from the beginning. Growing up, Rajneesh was described as adventurous. He was the ringleader of a group of boys who loved to cause mischief and swim in the river at the edge of town. Rajneesh told his Rajneeshis that he liked to seek thrills and stretch his mental limits by hiking on a cliff edge above a river. He said the risk, the physical challenge, the concentration, and the awareness of death produced a mental state akin to meditation. Young Rajneesh uh, also, uh, obs- uh, was also obsessed with meditation and dedicated himself to the practice. 1951, at the age of 19, Rajneesh graduated high school and began attending the University of uh, Jubalpur. He had no interest in joining the family's cloth business. He moved 130 miles away from his home to attend the university. His family supportive, paid for his education. He studied English, philosophy, logic, political science. He worked part-time as a copy editor on the Nav Bharat, a Hindi newspaper. In 1953, Rajneesh took a gap year to, to soul search, to meditate. He claimed that during his time off, he achieved enlightenment. Bingo, bango! That's a fucking gap year. You take a year off school, boom, enlightened. Fuck yeah. He said at the age of 21, he had a spiritual awakening. He was disturbed by spiritual questions before this awakening, so much so it affected his health. He, he had headaches, had to force himself to eat. He started running five to eight miles a day, twice a day. He's a fucking champion. Try and clear his head. You know, the question just wouldn't leave him alone. So he began a spiritual quest. Rajneesh claimed to experience uh, his enlightenment March 21st, 1953, in an event he called the explosion. He said he reached enlightenment while sitting quietly beneath a tree in Banvartal Garden, a park in Jolbapur. And that's when the universe, or some ancient and wise being, was like, Chandra Mohanjin, you are to be the Bhagwan. You are to enlighten the world to group therapy gang rapes. You have to teach your followers to beat wisdom into one another's skulls. Fists and dicks, only fists and dicks will enlighten the world. Something like that. He heard some kind of message. I don't fucking know. He didn't say exactly. Maybe it was that one. Uh, the park caretaker did recall in, in an interview with the Oregonian that Rajneesh visited in the mornings and evenings and sometimes even stayed in this park overnight. Maybe he was getting enlightened. Maybe he liked to jerk off in a park. I don't know. Rajneesh came to believe that individual religious experience is the only thing one spiritual life should be grounded in and that such unique experiences can't be organized into one religion or belief system, right? This kind of a uh, humanistic philosophy, here, you know, which I like. Essentially, he believed that organized religion had it all wrong. So what uh, should he do to help the world? He should make another religion. <laughs> I don't, I don't like that. Uh, dude could have just stopped her, you know, uh, maybe writing some books. Maybe write some fucking books, make some VHS tapes, leave it there. But that wouldn't be enough to help enlighten the world. And or that wouldn't be enough to line his bank accounts, you know, with millions and millions of dollars going forward. Uh, Rajneesh didn't tell anyone about his explosion. Not yet. He said, I declared it only when I knew that I could create my own small world. And I was no more concerned with the crowds and the masses and the stupid mob. I had to build a cult first, then strengthen the bonds between guru and devotee with that little bit of backstory. Uh, Rajneesh eventually returned to school, earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy from University of uh, uh, Jabalpur in 1955, then pursued his master's in philosophy at uh, Sagar University, graduated in 1957. 1959, at the age of 25, Rajneesh appointed lecturer at Maha Mahakushal Arts College, University of Jabalpur, but was never made full professor. He was said to be confrontational with other staff and students when it came to pushing what he believed was the right philosophical answers. Well, that tracks. Hard to become a true cult leader without a streak of arrogance in you. Uh, at the same time, he was a teacher. Rajneesh began to travel around the country, teach his ideas on spirituality. Uh, this really pissed off his parents. They were adherents of the Jaina religion, and now he was using his college education that they had paid for to travel around and tell everyone to fuck religion. It's all bullshit, and you should reject taboos and not feel guilt. I wonder, I wonder how rapey he got when talking about breaking taboos, considering what his later encounter sessions would be like. Also wonder how those sessions would have gone if instead of session leaders just uh, mostly encouraging uh, women to sexually fulfill men, letting men overpower them, if, uh, you know, they were also, the men were uh, encouraged to overpower other men, right? Break more taboos, right? Fuck those guys. Fuck each other. Fuck each other. I'm guessing once a few guys got held down and really fucking sodomized or throat fucked, those sessions would have been revised pretty quick, right? They would have, uh, they would have given their, let's fuck the ego out of you policy, uh, a hard second look. Uh, Rajneesh began to build up a bit of a following with his early tours in which he started to distribute his writings. His tours often took him to Bombay where he built up his biggest early following. He'd lecture up to five times a day there. 
then talked to his students late into the night. By talk, probably, probably fucked. 1964, uh, Rajneesh began conducting meditation camps and recruiting more followers. According to a 1985 Oregonian article, Rajneesh began speaking at meditation camps across the Indian countryside in 1964 and resigned from the university in 1966 to concentrate on his lecturing and probably getting his dick sucked. I added that, not that. Although he liked playing to crowded lecture halls and parks, he didn't forego smaller audiences. Friends said he addressed any local Rotary Club or any group that would have him. He had the fire of enlightenment burning inside of him. Also, probably really enjoying the ego stroke, build more and more of a following anywhere he could, make more and more money, selling his writings and whatnot. Probably like getting in as many reps as possible, work out that Cobra-like signature oration style of his. The old gods often spoke of great floods and of punishing fires. The only fire I want to burn you in is the flames of enlightenment. As far as for floods, I too want to flood you. I want to drown you in peace and tranquilness. <laughs> Raji targeted religion in all his lectures, of course. It was core to his message of breaking free from the chains of the old religions. And he also likely uh, knew it would cause controversy, get people talking about him. He saw early on it was working. A growing number of his followers said goodbye to the religions of their parents, were drawn to his radical ideas and his fucking snake talk, uh, ignore the old teachings of traditional religion. Rajneesh never talked about forming his own religion. He taught that everyone was his or her own religion. But where my fucking necklace, my picture on it, listen to me. Uh, Rajneesh attacked uh, not just old religious figures and prophets, he even attacked more modern philosophers, even very popular ones in India, like Mahatma Gandhi. He attacked Gandhi for trying to synthesize religious thought and for adhering to tradition. You fucking synthesize religious thought too, you fucking liar. In uh, 1965, Rajneesh recruited a few businessmen of some means to support his new movement, turn it into something more, make it bigger, more profitable. The Oregonian reported they formed uh, Jivan Jagruti Kendra, the forerunner of the Rajneesh Foundation in 1965 to finance Guru's activities, the Guru's activities, uh, freeing him from the need to collect academic paychecks. Rajneesh selected the trust name, uh, which translates to Life Awakening Center. Yeah, fucking wake up! And fucking eat my bullshit. 1966, Rajneesh was able to resign from teaching to focus fully on spreading his spiritual message. He also became a pariah to most people in the local community. Earned uh, the derogatory nickname, the sex guru. Better than rape guru, which seems to me to line up better with his later session practices if he wasn't already doing that. Uh, Rajneesh met his future personal secretary and prominent figure in the cult, Ambalal Patel Sheila, in 1968. Sheila would eventually run the cult on his behalf and act as Rajneesh's spokesperson. And Sheila, before going over some of her bio stats, uh, you got to hear this pistol in action. She truly did not seem to give any fucks about almost anything. She really spoke her mind. Uh, remove her abrasive confrontational personality from the Rajneesh equation, and I think their Oregon compound experiment might have lasted at least a few more years. Uh, here's a little highlight reel someone put together of sound bites from televised interviews and speeches she gave. Sorry about the background music. I always fucking hate when they do that. I think it's better without it, but it is what it is. If they're not aware of my determination, I think they're stupid. They're unintelligent. I don't run for cover. And person like you make me run for cover? Oh, that's a joke. You tell your governors, you tell your attorney general, and all your bigoted pigs outside, they touch any of our people, I will have 15 of their heads, and I'm in business. We don't want the orange people in our town. What can I say? Tough titties. Tough titties. God, it's my favorite thing she says. Tough titties. Tough titties, everyone. Tough titties. I love the way she says it. Uh, Sheila was born in the Indian state of uh, Gujarat, 1949, the youngest of six siblings. Ambalal Patel, her father, fell in love with her mother, Mani Ben Patel, at a train station. They got married, lived a unconventional lifestyle, which prepared her for cult activities later. Sheila's family supported uh, you know, a lot of nudity, a lot of body confidence. You know, that's, that's good. It's fine. She and her sisters are often seen swimming naked, which their neighbors considered improper. Probably not all their neighbors. Probably most of their neighbors. I'm guessing any neighbor, uh, neighborhood teen boys or neighborhood teen girls and girls had absolutely no problem with it because uh, she was fucking hot. She would pose naked in some Rajneeshi publications in her 20s, fully nude. And yeah, she had a great body. She even said so herself. I thought it was pretty funny in an interview. You know, this guy's like, does these pictures embarrass you? And she's like, why? I have a great body. And she, you know, fucking nailed it. She wasn't wrong. Um, she was just 16 years old, 1968, when her father approached her, said they were going to visit the Bhagwan, a man who uh, he believed would be the next Buddha 
if he lived long enough. They would visit this future Buddha's apartment in Bombay. And Sheila said, I saw Bhagwan, and that was the end of me. Sheila hugged him, immediately started crying. That hypnotic motherfucker was good. He had immense cult game talent. He was, a, he was an all-star cult leader. He was all pro. First team all pro. Uh, Sheila later said in the documentary, Wild Wild Country, my whole head melted. My life was complete. My life was fulfilled. Sheila was fascinated by everything Bhagwan had to say. Sheila said in her documentary interview, Bhagwan was very modern, very hip, uh, a fashion. He appealed to the intellectuals, intellectuals who were tired of the tradition and mundane lifestyle. In 1968, Rajneesh began a new series of lectures on love and doubled down on his sex guru reputation, declaring that sex was divine. In his book, From Sex to Superconsciousness, he wrote, the primal energy of sex has the reflection of God in it. It is obvious. It is the energy that creates new life. And that is the greatest, most mysterious force of all. You know, I, I don't also hate this, or I also don't hate this. Uh, sex, when it's great, you know, you put the right music on, light the right candles, maybe throw in some molly, lotions, lubes, take your time with it. Have with someone you not only have primal attraction to, uh, but also love. Uh, yeah, okay. That sensualness can feel pretty fucking divine. Feels like you're tapping into something not entirely this world. He knew what he's doing here, how to make people feel good. Uh, these lectures were extremely controversial. Numerous uh, dates of his were canceled by venues because they were too controversial. Then a month later, he found a new venue, gave the same lecture to a crowd of 15,000. I loved he's a fucking rock star, right? These lectures promoting sex positivity attracted a bunch of sexually repressed Westerners. A lot of them have money. Uh, Bagwan's traveling extensively, giving more speeches. In Sheila's words, his goal was to attract the cream of society. In my words, he wanted to attract desperate people with money who he could trick into giving him that sweet money. Uh, he began not just selling self-printed writings, but publishing his own books, which made him again, according to Sheila, bigger than a rock star. Uh, guessing this single dude, now 36, getting his fair share of uh, orgies in around this time too. Uh, by 1969, Rajneesh traveled almost constantly on the road three weeks a month. Then he decides to shift his focus fully to Bombay, try and figure out a way to get his message out, build more followers, uh, get his deck sucked, but not have to travel so much. He started to interact with some of the women that attended his lectures there, began uh, inviting them for private audiences to help them along the path of enlightenment, which meant fuck them. Seriously. And he would charge them for that. He's getting women to pay him for that magic guru dick. He has just leveled up as a cult leader. He just, uh, he's rolled a good die, a good die roll, just gained a plus three on his charisma. 1970, Rajneesh now begins promoting the practice of dynamic meditation. and His followers, uh, following grows further. At one point around this time, Rajneesh spoke in and around Bombay to stadiums of up to 20 to 30,000 people, all there just to hear his message. As more Westerners arrived, Rajneesh wanted to create a, a place for large group meditations now. In 1971, he takes on the title of Bhagwan. Uh, and by takes, I mean, gives it to himself. It means blessed one. Using several Indian spiritual traditions as a term of respect for a human being in whom the divine is no longer hidden, but is apparent. He began heavily advertising his religion to Westerners, initiated, you know, not a religion, but religion uh, to Westerners, initiated disciples who would follow his rules, disciples who, uh, you know, would take on new names, wear designated cl colors, uh, even those lockets with his picture in them, you know, cult, cult, cult. He's fucking leveling up again, plus one in strength, plus two in constitution, dark wizards getting more powerful. So it really begins. According to Sheila and others, Raj Nish was especially interested in Westerners for their money. His personal secretary locks me would brief him on the, uh, you know, Rajneesh's background or the Sa Sani, God, Saniasan's backgrounds. And uh, some Saniasans told the Oregonian later that uh, those who had more money got more attention from Bhagwan. Of course they did. He knew the fuck he was doing. 1974, Rajneesh moved his, excuse me, primary ashram to the city of Pune, city of 5 million, 90 miles east of Bombay. In the midst of this bustling city in large, uh, uh, in large slums uh, is now a gated garden oasis, his ashram. His first large cult compound. I saw a tour of it in a documentary and it's fucking gorgeous. Still there. Meditation areas full of ponds, beautifully landscaped foliage. This massive estate also full of modern meeting centers, you know, residences. Looks like it has probably fucking good Wi-Fi. Now called the Osho International Meditation Resort. They have what they call a full Osho multiversity program of courses, individual sessions, and morning classes. Looks pretty fucking sick, actually. They got, they got a spa, pool, jacuzzi, gym, tennis courts, vibrant nightlife. Pizzeria, nice restaurants, hotels. Because of the strength of the dollar, a few American meat sacks, you can actually stay there for a whole month right now, full month, with classes and accommodations, but not food, for only $1,800. That's 140,000 rupees. Fuck it, give it a crack. Maybe you'll get invited to a sex party. Maybe you'll get uh, held down and enlightened. Uh, maybe you'll get to, uh, I don't know, suck some new guru in training's dick. Because you don't want to be sucking Bhagwan's dick anymore. I'm going to tell you that much. He's been dead for over 32 years. There's not going to be a lot of guru dick left. 
uh, you know, it's going to be rough. What, what is left, if anything? Back to 1974, when Bhagwan first opened his Puna Enlightenment Honky Tonk and Rape Club, uh, followers came from all over the world to meet Bhagwan and probably to fuck other followers, I'm guessing. Life at the ashram was simple. Bhagwan gave a discourse in the mornings. Followers meditated, practiced yoga, fucked, beat the shit out of each other in encounter sessions in the afternoon, uh, drank tea with their friends in beautiful gardens. <laughs> pretty simple. It's all pretty straightforward. Uh, but soon Rajneesh grew tired of all the noise, I guess. He got tired of the constant fucking and fighting and meditating. And he began to isolate himself from his followers. He stopped directing meditations and instead he arrived before his followers in limos or Rolls Royces to give discourses and then, you know, just kind of keep on driving. Nothing says enlightenment like a fucking limo. That's when you know you've arrived, when you're king or queen shit. When you're sitting in the back of a weirdly long car that actually is not that comfortable, drinking champagne you don't even really like, popping your head out of the sunroof like a silly asshole to address people you clearly view as your minions and don't respect. Outside of these pretty douchey appearances, uh, Bhagwan isolated himself for the most part with his inner circle at his house and rarely left the ashram. To increase income in the mid-70s, uh, Rajneesh started franchising his definitely not a fucking religion religion. Started sending some disciples off to create meditation centers around the world. Chose some of them to be department heads, keep business operations running. Other disciples with training in martial arts acted as his personal bodyguards. He wanted security because he was having some health problems. He began suffering from diabetes, allergies, uh, some serious back problems, badly bulging discs. That's weird. He must have had shitty uh, meditation form. You'd think with all his yoga and meditation and being enlightened and whatnot, uh, he'd have better health. Maybe he hurt himself with all the fucking. Maybe he threw his back out, you know, helping some curvy follower get uh, enlightened. Uh, the perception from outside of his following uh, or outside of his growing little cult was that there was no class system, just the guru and the minions, the Bhagwan and the, uh, you know, uh, Rajneeshis, Charles Manson and the family. You get it. But when you get inside the ashram, you could easily see a clear hierarchy, as I alluded to earlier, right? People in Rajneesh's inner circle receive preferential treatment. People with valuable skills like lawyers, architects, city planners, secretaries, treated much better, given much better accommodations and better food than uh, other people who were less skilled, just given menial jobs and Spartan accommodations. By the late 70s, the ashram in Puna, so overcrowded, sources don't put a solid number on how many people were living there, uh, that the group felt they needed to relocate. Bhagwan promised his followers a new commune where they could all live together and expand further. Cult, cult, cult. The Rajneeshis needed money, housing, and land, and Sheila had a brilliant idea how to get it. What if they stole it from their followers? I mean, borrowed it, but never fucking gave it back. They had 4,000 uh, Sanesians, 4,000 Rajneeshis who could loan them money. So that's what they did. She set up a bank with the card system overnight. Within a few days, they had hundreds of thousands of dollars at their disposal. Right? Bhagwan then sent his personal secretary, Laxmi, to go find their new land. He ordered her not to return until she closed the deal. And she went all over India, but no one wanted to sell her the land. By this point, the movement was considered uh, so controversial that local governments kept creating roadblocks, making it difficult for the group to relocate. Uh, the Indian government even revoked a tax-exempt status for the group, made that status reversal retroactive, and suddenly wanted them to cough up $5 million. Then in 1980, making things even worse for him, a Hindu fundamentalist, furious at the guru for denouncing Hinduism, Vilas Tupe, uh, attempted to assassinate Bhagwan, threw a knife at him in, in, uh, from a, in a, in a large crowd of followers. This on top of the government wanting them to pay up that money, not being able to find new land, motivated the group to now relocate the fuck out of India. Frustrated with the secretary's lack of progress, finding suitable land for the new compound, Rajneesh asked Sheila what she thought of Laxmi, and Sheila said, and I quote, fuck that clown bitch. Fucking tough titties. Nah, that's not exactly what she said. Uh, she said something to the effect that she didn't think Laxmi was uh, capable of finding the land. Bhagwan asked Sheila where she'd take him. She said, let's go to the U.S., so he promoted her to secretary on the spot and ordered her to go find land in America. That's exactly what she did. She was especially dedicated to Bhagwan, possibly because of a past tragedy he'd helped her through. She had lived in America for a while before living with Bhagwan in Puna. She moved to uh, New Jersey in 1967 at the age of 18. Uh, that year, uh, the year before meeting him, sorry, every time I say, say something like that, the age of 18, blew, blew the boys away. It was more than they'd seen. I get this Tom Petty fucking riff stuck in uh, Then she returned to America after meeting him, not returning to India full-time until 1972, when her and her husband now both joined the cult. When she was studying at Montclair College in New Jersey, she fell deeply in love with a man named Mark Harris Silverman. He'd been suffering from Hodgkin's disease on and off for about 13 years, and he would pass away during their relationship, and when he died, the Rajneeshis held a special funeral for him. Bhagwan told doctors to put Sheila to sleep for three days to help her with her grief. When she woke up, he told her that this chapter, that that chapter of her life was over and uh, she should bury herself in their work now. And then she became super devoted to him. 
April 11th, 1981, the Rajneesh Foundation announces that Bhagwan is going to enter a period of silence and will only stare and hiss, I mean speak, to those in his inner circle. My sweet assassins, listen to the sounds of my silence. This will go on for several years. Uh, about three, I believe. I'll say the exact figure later. And it really let uh, Sheila grow in power to the detriment of the group, it seems. Sheila now became Bogwan's spokesperson, his voice. She was given uh, irrevocable power of attorney. She began securing the land purchase in Oregon in secret. Then she met with her team, told them they were going to America. May 20th, 1981, Rajneesh applies for a four-month temporary visa to visit the U.S., claiming he needs medical treatment unavailable in India, surgery for his back, a surgery he'll never get. Might have greatly exaggerated his back pain. On June 1st, 1981, Rajneesh, his secretary, Sheila, and others in his inner circle leave for the U.S. They land in New York, uh, stay, in a, stay in a castle, described as a castle in some sorts, in Montclair, New Jersey, owned by one of the cult's organizations. And they, uh, yeah, did this without telling any followers. L.A. Times speculated in a 1901 uh, article that Rajneesh moved to America because of more than just tax problems and having a hard time finding a, a new compound in India. They wrote about how similar to the relationship he would later have with the people of Antelope, Oregon, in the surrounding area, most of the people around Puna fucking hated him. Hated him so much, they tried to burn down his uh, compound twice. Committed two acts of arson. Hated him more after followers at his ashram accused their landlord of sexually assaulting a female disciple. The landlord said he was being framed because he refused to cede over some disputed water rights to the group, to the cult. The American consulate found that sexual entrapment was a common manipulation technique uh, employed by the cult. They wrote, an individual, usually a man, would be lured into a situation where he found himself alone with an ashram female. After a short time, the female would claim she had been molested. Amazingly enough, there were often cameras and recorders present. Then an ashram official would appear and offer to trade silence on a sexual charge for something the ashram wanted. Pressuring females to uh, sexually entrap people. So very enlightened. July 10th, 1981. The Chilvila's Roshnish Meditation Center purchases the Big Muddy Ranch in Central Oregon for approximately $5.75 million. 15 Roshnishis move onto the ranch immediately, begin building the community as many others begin to join them. So Oregon, here they come. When the group first arrived, they told the people of Antelope they were going to operate a simple farm and religious commune with 50 agricultural workers. Within a month, they applied for permits to locate 34 trailers on the Waskell County portion of the ranch. In those first months of the ranch, they got a lot of shit done. Hundreds of cult members, no exact figure exists. Work from dusk till dawn, right? And three or four shifts, or I'm sorry, from, I guess it'd be from dawn to dusk. Morning to night. Uh, they built infrastructure, power, water, plumbing. They even built their own roads. They drove trucks, operated heavy machinery, led construction projects, so much physical labor. Over the next few years, they'd build villages, a bank, a shopping center, a pizza bar, meditation hall, airport, dam, farms. They soon produced almost all their own food by themselves. The Rajneeshis were proud of what they created with their blood, sweat, and tears. Meanwhile, local residents of Antelope were fuming. They didn't trust the Rajneeshis. Their quiet lives had been disrupted. Soon the cult would begin buying up buildings in town. Their free-loving ways would spill onto the, out of the compound and into Antelope. Nudity and the sounds of fucking would become common. Seriously. Lucifina was in charge of Antelope now. Most locals uh, felt that the liberated ideals of the group were a bit scandalous. Mayor Margaret Hill quickly became especially outspoken against the group, openly advocating for them to go back to India. And while I have less of a problem with sexual expression than the typical American, uh, I, I would love for our culture to become much more sexually liberated. I can see how this would be genuinely upsetting. I mean, what if for your whole life you've been raised with the expectation to keep your sex life private, to be modest? That's all you've ever been around. You know, and you see your very quiet, remote rural town as a refuge from the more sexualized ways to bigger towns and cities. It's part of what you like about it. Modest, quiet, conservative. Then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of new neighbors move in. They don't talk like you. They don't uh, believe in any form of spirituality you are familiar with. They are not private with their sexuality at all. They're naked in their backyards, right? Having an orgy in the living room, the house next door maybe with the windows open, really letting those orgasm groans fucking rip in a fully uh, uninhibited way. I mean, that would be a bit jarring. And based on documentary footage, it didn't seem like the cult members made any effort whatsoever to compromise with locals and meet them halfway in any of this shit. It seemed like they very obnoxiously and aggressively just pushed their lifestyle on them. Very much an attitude of, you know, we're here. We're going to fuck like animals. You're going to hear it. Sometimes you're going to see it. And if you don't like it, well, tough titties. Don't get fucked. And to be fair to the people of Antelope, you know, uh, that just isn't too neighborly. August 29th, 1981, as uh, all the uh, 
as the new compound is being initially being built. Now, 49 year old quiet guy, Rajneesh, arrives on the ranch for the first time. Sheila, still his voice, will be for a while, his face of the cult. She moves into a large house in the ranch called Jesus Grove. And she moves her inner circle into this house. And after her nightly meetings with Bhagwan, she will relay important information to them. Living in Jesus Grove with Sheila was the ultimate status symbol, but it came at a price. Anyone who lived in the house was at her constant beck and call, had to do anything she asked, anytime she ordered it. She was demanding, moody, insulting, quickly made a lot of enemies in the cult before later, later making more outside of the cult. People still wonder if she was the real reason the cult would end up crumbling or if she just ended up being a scapegoat. Was she carrying out Bogwan's bidding when she went on to do a bunch of nefarious shit or was she pushing her own agenda? In October of 1981, the Portland District Office of the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service ordered by the regional headquarters to begin investigating the Rajneeshis for immigration fraud. Locals tipped them off. They'd grown more concerned as hundreds and hundreds of more followers began moving in from India. And so a legal back and forth battle begins. Locals versus Rajneeshis. Old ways versus the new ways. New fucking weird ways. November 4th, 1981. Wasco County Court approves a petition for an incorporation vote for the city of Rajneesh Purim. Right, the cult seeks to incorporate 2,000 acres of the ranch into a city. But then 24 voters in Antelope file a petition asking that the community be disincorporated and turned over to the county. And then an environmental group, 1,000 Friends of Oregon, files a lawsuit against Rajneesh Purim on behalf of Antelope. They argued that, like the, the town, not the fucking creature, they argued that the Rajneeshis were not using the land for its original intended purpose of a simple farm and that their buildings should be torn down. And this group had some powerful local allies, like Bill Bowerman, Met him earlier, the incredible wealthy co-founder of Nike. Owned a ranch near the Big Muddy Ranch, the original name of the land the cult bought. Antelope residents Kelly and Rosemary McGre uh, McGreer also owned a lot of farmland near the ranch. And they all wanted their interests protected because the Rajneeshis were considering establishing a city of at least 10,000 people with a hotel and developments that would disturb their land and their way of life. Bowerman donated frequently to 1,000 Friends, even became the spokesman for them during this lawsuit. Attorneys for a thousand friends of Oregon told the Rajneesh representatives that they would have to seek ex exception under goal two of Oregon land use laws. A thousand friends believed the Rajneeshis would not be granted this exception because the type of farming they said they wanted to do originally was already permissible under Oregon laws. They could get permits for any farm related structures they wanted to build on a case by case basis. Rajneesh uh, lawyers responded that was too burdensome, too expensive. Lawyers then approached the Wasco County court with a findings of fact that stated the uses to be established within the proposed city are of a rural nature to meet the needs of the predominantly agricultural workforce residing within the area. Limited commercial and industrial uses will be of a similar nature. After the findings of fact was submitted, commissioners Rick Cantrell and Virgil Ellett overrode the position of a third commissioner to allow Rajneesh Purim to incorporate. Why would these two side against the locals, against the people who voted them into their positions? Rumors of the cult bribing county officials immediately began to swirl. And it does look bad. Right after overriding another commissioner, the Rajneeshis had purchased Cantrell's entire herd of horses for a lot more than they were worth. Interesting. And they'd done that when he was having some difficulty paying off some debt. They didn't pay him for the horses until after he made the vote in their favor either. So, wee bit suspicious. After receiving permission to incorporate as a city, the Rajneeshis began building several hundred houses, several multiplex apartment complexes, a two-story shopping mall, a 21,900-square-foot counseling complex, a series of office buildings and restaurants, large warehouse, four-story hotel, factory, an airport landing strip capable of accommodating private jet airplanes. They went fucking big. Rajneesh later said he wanted to build a city that would eventually accommodate 100,000 people, all his followers. And they were actually on their way to pulling that off before Sheila's confrontations with locals derailed it. Sheila was fucking furious about that thousand friends lawsuit. She wanted to make those fuckers suck on so many tough titties. Suck a thousand tough titties. One for every friend. Uh, she said that if the friends wanted to tear down her buildings, I will paint their bulldozers with my blood. I'll be proud to be under those bulldozers. If they are not aware of my determination, I think they are stupid. Again, she's a pretty abrasive diplomatic style. Uh, she quickly took action during the lawsuit began buying up properties in Antelope to secure their existence as a city. They took over the town, moved their business operations to Antelope, purchased the town's cafe, which deeply upset the town's residents. It's their only cafe, right? Because now, and I guess this was a real point of contention. I love this. They wouldn't serve bacon anymore. Fucking love details like that so much. Such a little thing, but that would piss off locals. Oh, God damn it, Marlon. They took the fucking bacon off the menu. We have one cafe. Now I got to drive 75 goddamn miles to the fucking Dallas to get the breakfast I want. 
fucking weird ass hippies. I'm about to lose my shit. I can deal with the loud fucking. Hell, I've made my peace with seeing all those titties. Some of them have some pretty goddamn fine racks, I'm not gonna lie to you. But the bacon, the fucking bacon, mark this day on your calendar, Marlon. This shit is our Pearl Harbor. We're at fucking war now. Uh, Sheila and the cult bought any houses for sale in town, and some that weren't even listed. They offered full price or above market value for properties, which was more money than most local people could refuse. Buying the houses allowed some uh, Rajneeshis to become residents of Antelope, therefore eligible to join the city council and vote on issues. In protest, some Antelope residents created anti-Bhagwan t-shirts, hats, stickers. They walked around with rifles, threatened some of the Rajneeshis, vandalized some of their properties. Shit is getting contentious. In response, some cult members in Antelope harassed locals by shining spotlights into their houses at night, uh, by filming, taking photos of people, doing daily activities just to freak them out. Local atmosphere getting heated. Felt like a shooting could occur any day now. So much drama for a tiny-ass town that had been quiet for so long. March 12, 1982, the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals dismisses the challenge to the incorporation of Rajneesh Purim. Colt wins this battle too. And then instead of just quietly celebrating this little victory, they attack their adversaries. Allegedly, but probably. Interestingly, right after this victory, numerous people associated with a thousand friends and the Antelope City Council uh, receive boxes of chocolates in the mail with a note that says, thank you for your support to preserve the Columbia River Gorge. Some of these people eat the chocolate and they get very sick. Uh, one person found a, a chocolate with a pinprick in the bottom. Chocolate had been poisoned. Mike Sullivan, Jefferson County DA, almost died. Bill Hulse, Wasco County Judge, also almost died. Suck on those tough titties, motherfuckers. Poison tough titties. Uh, many will later suspect Sheila had planned this. Payback for them trying to fuck with the cult that she'd become the public face of. April 15th, 1982. The Antelope City Council tries to vote to disincorporate the town, but loses the vote to the new Rajneeshi residents, 55 to 22. Right, their plan of buying up all those houses worked. Another battle won by the cult. May 18th, 1982, the Rajneeshis vote 154 to zero to incorporate the city of Rajneesh Purim on 2,013 uh, acres of their 64,229 acre Rancho Rajneesh. But then on December 23rd, 1982, the Immigration and Naturalization Service turns down two of Rajneesh's requests to stay in the U.S. based on health concerns and his role as a religious leader. So they're not winning all the battles, right? The cult appeals its decision. Six months later, the cult then gets attacked, right? They get attacked in India. They get attacked here. July 29th, 1983, the Hotel Rajneesh in downtown Portland is bombed. First bomb goes off 1.19 a.m. Two more bombs go off 2.56 a.m. Luckily, the bomber, Stephen P. Pasteur, only one injured. He lost a few of his fingers in the explosion. He was convicted of the bombing, would spend five years in prison. Uh, a motive was never, excuse me, presented to the jurors. But Deputy District Attorney Charles French said in a pretrial hearing that Pastor belonged to a militant fundamentalist Muslim organization, guessing he figured that Allah did not care for their free-loving, religion-hating ways. Guessing. Uh, the Rajneeshis responded publicly that going forward, they would do anything to protect themselves from future threats. And they purchased a bunch of weapons for the ranch. Now they take some time away from meditation, start doing target practice, form a militia. Most of the remaining uh, original residents of Antelope, pretty fucking terrified. Also in July of 1983, Rajneesh Purim hosts a massive festival. The Rajneeshis from all over the world come to see the Bhagwan. It's a giant party for thousands of people. Bhagwan pulls up in a Rolls Royce like a fucking douche to silently greet his followers. Uh, the sch schedule events features things like uh, uh, satsang, a direct heart-to-heart -heart communication in the presence of Bhagwan. So cool. People literally communicate with their hearts, you guys. Uh, there were dynamic meditations, kundalini meditation, discourses, live music celebrations. All the visitors had to pay for all this stuff. Big money-making opportunity for the cult. Meanwhile, local bureaucrats trying to come up with new ways to get rid of all these cult members. October 6, 1983, Oregon Attorney General Dave Fronmayer uh, issues an opinion that the city of Raj Rajneesh Purim violated a separation of church and state clause in the uh, Oregon legislation, you know, in the Oregon government. Month later, November 9th, 1983, Attorney General Dave Fraunmeyer files a suit challenging again the incorporation of Rajneesh Purim. Locals wanted these people gone. Following summer, July of 84, residents of Antelope vote 57 to 22 to change the town's name to Rajneesh. Oh boy. Oh boy. Rajneesh is now changing the street names to Hindu names as well. And they convert a small green area in this little tiny town into a nude sunbathing area. And now they're really doing a lot of public fucking. So many titties, tough and otherwise, flopping about all around town. More and more residents complaining about hearing sex noises all the time now. But who are they complaining to? Deaf ears. 
right? The cult runs this fucking town. What a strange little slice of history this all is. I picture the 911 operator being Rajneeshi, right? Rajneesh 911, what's your emergency of enlightenment obstacle? Uh, yeah, this is Dale Greenwood, uh, 43 Oak Road. Goddamn, I mean, 43 Bogwan Lane. I can't get to sleep because my next door neighbor's having an orgy. Sounds delightful. Have you tried asking them if you can join? I find it so much easier to go to sleep after experiencing a really intense orgasm. Uh, no, I, no I've not done that. I'm a married man. Oh, I'm sure they'd be happy to fuck your wife as well. Marriage is an arbitrary social construct. The Bhagwan does not feel necessary to the path of enlightenment. Good night and may peace find and guide you. What the fuck? Uh, the cult did actually run the local police force too. They sent followers to the police academy to establish a peace force. Their name for the town's new police force. All these massive changes started attracting a lot of press interest in what was going on around there. Sheila went on every TV show that would have her to promote the cult's growing town. She became an outrageous TV personality, which got the cult even more news coverage. Most of it, not good. Some of her responses to people's complaints and accusations were, fuck you, and you're full of shit. And of course, the classic, tough titties. God, no one loved tough titties more than Sheila. Uh, August 1984, the Rajneesh Humanity Trust, one of the cult's many subgroups, created for tax purposes, begins to recruit homeless people to come live at Rajneesh Purim now. They called it their uh, Share a Home Project. We referenced that earlier. Not actually a humanitarian effort at all. Uh, what they were doing here, not very enlightened, just selfish and fucked up. They'd taken the town of Antelope, and now these overreaching motherfuckers wanted to take the whole county to get county officials off their backs. They wanted to gain control of the Waskow County Commission. And to accomplish that, they actually planned to poison two county commissioners, then run their candidates for those open seats. Easy peasy. The hundreds and hundreds of formerly homeless people, they were busted into the area, would be registered to vote, and they would be heavily pressured to vote in their favor. And the Rajneeshis now traveled around the country, handing out free bus tickets to their Oregon compound. Once men and women arrived, they were provided clothing, grooming, medical, vision, dental services, food, housing, and work opportunities. And all the cult asked for in exchange was that they register to vote and vote in favor of Rajneesh Purim. What could go wrong with this plan? It's foolproof. Just bust hundreds of homeless people to the compound to commit voter fraud after assassinating a few local officials. Oh man, this, this reeks of so much enlightenment. Uh, and if you can't see that, well, then tough titties, asshole. October 10th, 1984, a group of 20 formerly homeless people attempt to register to vote at the Wasco County Courthouse in the Dallas. And this immediately reads as fucking suspicious. Come on, guys. Only 16,000 people live in the Dallas. Only 25,000 live in Wasco County. They, people know who other locals are. You know, they know who's clearly not from the area. You can't pull this shit off in a small rural area. The county immediately suspends these people's rights to vote in a blanket rejection because they believe there is a conspiracy to commit voter fraud, which there was. The Rajneesh Legal Services Corporation then files a lawsuit arguing hindrance against voter rights. And then the county's decision is upheld by a federal judge on October 23rd. All right. The cult uh, right, is losing this, losing this battle. Then some bad press follows. The homeless people who had been brought in were furious about how they were treated after they weren't allowed to vote. They no longer held any value for the cult. They'd been promised tickets to go back home, but then the cult doesn't deliver. They're just tossed out, right? And they're not giving shit. Sheila, again, suspected of this impulsive, short-sighted move. Really stupid. Like they're not going to rat the cult out now. Like they're not going to dish some dirt to the press. And they did dish some dirt. Dwayne Hartman said to a reporter for the Columbia newspaper, it's a peace and love thing, right? Wrong. Everywhere you look, there's someone checking up on you. Steve Marinwell said, I hated it. It was like a terrorist camp. John Irwin said to the Richmond Times Dispatch, there's rampant sex and they're trying to twist people's minds in these all day brainwashing sessions. He claimed he was assaulted too when he refused to register to vote. Reporter Roddy Ray wrote for the Detroit Free Press, periodically during dinner, a voice came over the loudspeaker saying, attention friends, if you are an American citizen and over 18, you are eligible to register to vote. Some people claim that basic necessities like food, clothing, and bedding were withheld if they refused to answer that call. Warren Barnes told the Seattle Times, it's a constructed environment that invokes most of the senses. Color predominates. predominates. Image pre uh, dominates. You see Bhagwan's picture all the time. Words predominate. Rajneesh, Rajneesh, Rajneesh. It's a continuing process where you can be a baby again. And these subliminal things weaken your will to resist. Donnie Hartman also told the Times, they say peace there, but there's guns everywhere you look. They say no lies, but I was lied to until I left. Michael Sprouse told the Weekly Reminder, these people are dedicated and dangerous. They are dedicated fanatics and they're armed, psyched up to the point of firing on American citizens or U.S. military personnel if the Bhagwan asks them to. I know Oregon people are concerned, but I don't think they're taking them as seriously as they should. And then Holly Anderson would say to the Spokesman Review, 
I was promised a life on a beautiful commune where I'd always have enough to eat and a bed to sleep on, a community to call my own. But in the end, all I got was a pair of tough titties to suck on. Sheila made me suck on them until they started to produce milk, and her titties were really, really tough. Took four days. I still haven't regained full feeling in my lips. I may, I may have made up the Holly Anderson part, but the rest, that was real. All in the name of enlightenment. Ten days before the election, Sheila kicks out most of homeless people, uh, leaves them to fend for themselves, right? Fucking tough titties, if you don't like it. Uh, Sheila then brings together her inner circle to discuss a new way to win the election. She plans and helps carry out a mass poisoning. October 1984, the cold infects 751 people in Wasco County with salmonella to try to keep them from voting or to prepare for an attack that will do that. Uh, they brewed up some salmonella in some fucking cult lab- laboratory. Various members of Sheila's crazy poison team spread salmonella on produce and grocery stores and on doorknobs, even on urinal handles in the county courthouse. Also contaminated the salad bars of 10 local restaurants with salmonella. 45 people would go to the hospital. Hundreds of others would call their doctors. Luckily, despite a few close calls, everyone survived. Even the newborn baby they almost killed. Now the CDC, the state health division, come in to investigate the cause of this food poisoning. Initially, food handlers are accused of causing the outbreak, but conspiracies soon circulate that the Rajneeshis are behind it. The Rajneesh Medical Corporation, another cult subgroup, responds with outrage. Oregon State Congressman Jim Weaver now publicly accuses the cult of being behind the poisoning. And he's fucking right, but he can't prove it, not yet. So he has to rescind his accusation. Back at Rajneesh Purim, things are unraveling. Sheila now stands on shaky ground with Bhagwan because of her failed share a home project. And because, you know, she tried to fucking kill or at least make, make very sick hundreds of locals. Her titties are getting too fucking tough. She also is uh, failing to accomplish important political goals. Bhagwan tells her she needs to win those seats in the county election. And her position as secretary is in jeopardy. She can't make that happen. Then making Sheila's life even harder, making her even more worried about losing her position as Bhagwan's number one follower, some Hollywood people show up. Some showbiz. Mahanda Hasia and Diva Raj. Hasia, formerly married to Al Ruddy, producer of The Godfather. Uh, Hasia married Diva Raj, who then became Bhagwan's personal physician. Hasia, Diva Raj have been throwing lavish parties for the Rajneeshis in Hollywood and raising a lot of money for Bhagwan. Also getting him shiny shit like a diamond-covered Rolex. And he loved shiny shit. Bhagwan now informs Sheila they're going to start a new corporation led by Hasia and Div, uh, Diva Raj. And she feels threatened. In Sheila's eyes, things are spiraling out of control. Bhagwan also now seems particularly unstable. He now begins to speak of doomsday. Damn it. Oh, man. That was one of my uh, favorite things about him is him not speaking about this. How cliche. He begins talking about how the uh, Rajneeshis are going to retreat underground during a upcoming collapse of society. Then afterwards, they will emerge to create a new world. Charles Manson predicted something very similar to his followers down in California less than 20 years earlier in 1968. Helter Skelter. That didn't end too well. Now Bhagwan predicted that 1984 would be the beginning of 15 years of catastro- uh, catastro- God damn it. Uh, catastrophic events. Catastrophes. There we go. Floods, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, nuclear explosions, all leading to a global holocaust. Here we go! Cult, cult, cult. He said Rajneeshism is creating a Noah's Ark of Consciousness remaining centered exactly in the middle of the cyclone. You can only escape within, and that's what I teach. I do not teach worship of God or any other ritual, but only a scientific way of coming to your innermost core. He doesn't teach worship of God, everybody. Calm down. He's not a typical doomsday preacher. He just teaches some kind of unexplained scientific way of seeing the future. And in that future, there's a doomsday. And if you stick with him, you'll survive. He's helping people out. That's all. This is not typical cult leader fear-based manipulation or anything. No way, Jose. Uh, one day in mid-1984, the Rajneesh Purim pharmacist approaches Sheila with a prescription written by Bhagwan's doctor that concerned her. It was for Valtrex. Now she knew who she'd gotten that cold sore from. No, she now believed that those uh, gosh dang Hollywood people had gotten Rajneesh hooked on some laughing gas and Valium. She'd later say she warned Bhagwan he couldn't use drugs. It would attract law enforcement. Bhagwan would deny using drugs, later accuse her of using the drugs. According to Sheila, Bhagwan told her to stay out of his business and she's heartbroken. She felt she had done everything for him. And now she's being tossed aside. In her words, there I lost my patience. Asiya and Divaraj now had more access to Bhagwan than Sheila did. And Sheila couldn't stand it. She had Bhagwan's room wiretapped now without his knowledge. She instructed some uh, Rajneeshis to listen to recorded cassette tapes, report anything suspicious. On one of the tapes, Sheila claimed to hear Bhagwan ask his doctor how to die in a painless, dignified way. And, bon- and Bhagwan's doctor telling him that the special medication he'd asked for had arrived. Bhagwan instructed him to bury it until it was needed. Sheila's now worried that the whole community is going to come to an end. And it was, but not because Bhagwan was going to kill himself because of her. 
Late October 1984, Bhagwan breaks his self-imposed three-year silence when it comes to leading his followers, begins teaching at the ranch again. He'd grown weary of Sheila speaking on his behalf. He was ready to speak for himself again, slowly and weirdly. My sweet assassinines, you no longer hear my words through Sheila. I'm tired of her tough titties. Your snake charmer, I mean guru, has returned and will no longer remain in silence. November 6, 1984, the Wasco County elections take place. The Rajneeshis lose in every way. No county commissioners uh, are assassinated. No empty seats create, created. No seats won by Rajneeshi candidates. However, the giant compound city uh, continues to grow for a little while. Estimated 7,000 people now live in there full time. July 6, 1985, Sheila calls her inner circle in for a meeting. Tells them she'd heard Bhagwan say he was going to die the following day, July 6, a day they referred to as Master's Day. This was a new holiday tradition that began in July of 1982 when they'd hosted their first big festival in Oregon. Big celebration of everything Rajneeshi. Big celebration of Bhagwan's life and teachings based on the holiday of Guru uh, Purnima. A tradition dedicated to all the spiritual and academic gurus who are evolved or enlightened humans ready to share their wisdom based on karma yoga. Celebrated as a festival in India, Nepal, uh, Bhutan by Hindus, Jains, and Buddhists. Festival falls in the full moon day of the Ashada month, June or July. And that tradition began in Buddhism. Uh, another example here of adopting something from a previous religion, taking what's familiar, putting your spin on it, kind of uh, creating something new. Um, sorry, got to get through some uh, sources. Sheila uh, told her inner circle that she couldn't let Bhagwan go through uh, with dying. She said they needed to kill Diva Raj before he killed the guru. And she asked who would do that for her. Cult spokesperson Shanti Badra speaks up, says she'll do it. Sheila now gives her some poison she uh, had gathered to assassinate Diva Raj with. She's getting fucking extra crazy as it starts to power down in this cult. Assassination plots against her own members now. Sheila trying to prove she has the toughest, most ruthless titties of them all in order to keep her status. Shanti now soon approaches Diva Raj in the gathering hall, tries to inject him with poison when he leans close to her to hear her. He sees what's going on, fights back. They struggle. He manages to wrestle away the needle, toss it as a side. Shanti now just plays dumb, acts like she never tried to stick him with a needle. It was her needle. What? What? What a crazy misunderstanding. No, stick you? No, I was about to inject myself. Uh, why would you take my needle? And hey, what's that over there? And then she just fucking walked away. Knowing she'll have to leave the cult forever soon after this. She has now reported to police because the cult doesn't want any outside law enforcement coming around. She just lays low, tries to stay away from Diva Raj and Bhagwan. Sheila's nervous now, worried that her assassination plot's going to be un uncovered. Next day, Bhagwan does not die. Sheila was wrong. Did she just make up that whole thing about the Bhagwan dying so she could get Shanti to uh, kill the man who had become closer to Bhagwan than she was? Probably. Jumping ahead two months now, September 13th, 1985, Sheila resigns as Rajneesh's personal secretary and as president of the church and several businesses. She later says in an interview, those last two days, they were full of pain to leave Bhagwan, a man I thought was inseparable from me. I'm taking the decision to leave. I'm taking the decision to leave from all these beautiful people who love me. I knew I would be excommunicated, but I'm leaving. I had to learn from Bhagwan, burn your bridges and go forward. On September 14th, 1985, Sheila, uh, uh, Ma Prem Puja and a few other members of the inner circle flee the ranch. Would-be assassin Shanti fe flees with them. On September 15th, 1985, 10 more Rajneesh Perm officials, including Mayor Krishna Deva, resign and leave the compound. September 16th, 1985, Bhagwan uh, Rajneesh accuses Sheila and other fleeing officials of various crimes, including attempting to murder his doctor. Bhagwan makes a statement to the press. I have been silent for three and a half years. The people who were in power took advantage of my silence. Sheila and her group, they tried to kill three people. They have attempted to murder people in the commune. They have attempted to murder people in the Dalles. They have attempted bugging people's houses, my own house. These people are absolutely criminals, inhuman, brutal, fascist in their outlook. She should have been here and faced me. She did not even come to say goodbye to me. People who don't commit crime don't escape like that. How long can you hide? And if the police are not going to take the action, then my people will take the action. Sheila then confronts Bhagwan in a video message saying, Bhagwan, it's time that you let people know who you are, the way I've come to know you, which is that on the one hand, you are a genius and a beautiful man. And on the other hand, you really exploit people by using their human frailty and emotion. Bhagwan responds in a press conference. She's on hard drugs. This is the one we saw earlier, right? I've never made love to her. Or at least I intended the show. Uh, that much is certain. Perhaps that is the jealousy. She always wanted, but I have made it a point, never make love to a secretary. Love affair never ends. It can turn into a hate affair. 
She did not prove to be a woman. She proved to be a perfect bitch. I think I just watched that a few times and didn't show it on the episode. Uh, Sheila and Rajneesh both spoke against each other on international news outlets now, accusing one another of being a fraud. Then a woman named Hasia becomes the new secretary and president of the Rajneesh Foundation International. Oh yeah, Hasia, the uh, doctor's wife. Uh, September 9th, 19th, 1985, state and federal law enforcement creates a joint task force now to investigate assassination allegations and more and set up a field office in Rajneesh Puram. Bhagwan had invited the police into the commune to investigate. Investigators discovered three single wide trailers that made up a cult poison lab, essentially. Authorities found out that the Rajneesh Medical Corporation housed a biological warfare fucking lab overseen by Pooja, right? That nurse. She was the one who supplied salmonella for the mass poisoning in the Dallas. She also had uh, other dangerous pathogens stockpiled in the lab. Other forms of uh, salmonella, one that causes typhoid fever. Another caused a less severe form of the uh, salmonella illness and also uh, um, multiple other pathogens. Why, one of uh, the particular bacteria they had is on the Pentagon's list of agents that may be used in biological warfare attacks. Also had the pathogen that causes uh, severe dysentery. Pooja reportedly wanted to use uh, the one that causes typhoid to poison the Wasco County vo- voters, but decided against it when she learned it could be, uh, you know, cause a typhoid epidemic that could be traced back to them. She's a fucking evil doctor. State health organization now found out that the salmonella from the food in the Dalles, identical to the stuff in the ranch's lab. The Rajneeshis had, you know, cultured it there. And then they brushed that salmonella over salad bars and restaurants in the Dalles, all around the courthouse. They ha- had a whole system. They rigged up the system. They had long sleeve jackets inside these jackets. They had little like fucking misters that would just spray out this fucking bacteria and poison shit. The CDC reported the cult planned to infect residents with salmonella on election day to influence the results of county elections. To practice for the attack, they contaminated salad bars at 10 restaurants, uh, you know, on several occasions before the election. A community-wide outbreak of salmonella resulted in at least 751 cases documented in a county that typically reports fewer than five a year. So, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, nefarious shit. Law, law enforcement also finds the following books on the compound in Pooja's possession. Deadly Substances, Handbook for Poisoning, and The Perfect Crime and How to Commit It. And they found articles on assassinations, explosives, and terrorism. Another article was titled Poison Investigation. Pooja had highlighted sec- sections on symptoms. Uh, there was a clear plastic bag full of articles on infectious diseases, chemical products, and chemical and biological warfare as well. Finally, authorities uncovered a top secret research project called Moses 5. And this project, the goal of it was to cultivate a live AIDS virus. Rajneesh had recently been predicting that two thirds of the world's population would soon die of AIDS. Now, obviously, the authorities wondered if Pooja was trying to develop a new, more lethal AIDS virus strain to make that prediction come true. What the fuck? Was Rajneesh the one ordering Sheila and Pooja to do all this shit? Enlightenment? This is how you enlighten the world by creating an unleashing the most deadly pathogen the world's ever seen by killing billions of innocent people? It's almost like this guy was fucking crazy or something. Meditation and counter-therapy. Killing lots of people. It's my new AIDS. That is the path of enlightenment. To see it, you must only open your eyes. New mayor of Russia, Rajneesh Purim, gave the FBI access to box, box, or many boxes of documents, other evidence. Turned in over 10,000 tapes found in a secret room hidden under Sheila's house. Right, because she'd been recording fucking everything. She uh, orchestrated one of the largest wiretapping operations in the history of the U.S. FBI also found evidence that Sheila Shanti Badra and another woman participated in a plot to assassinate the U.S. attorney for the District of Oregon, Charles Turner. They were going to fucking shoot this guy. Shanti and her accomplice instructed to purchase untraceable guns. Shanti then dropped the guns off to a man who took them to an unknown location. FBI found that Sheila had ordered the Rajneeshis to stalk Charles Turner with the intention of murdering him. Uh, Rajneesh, of course, claimed no knowledge of these criminal activities. Said he was just uh, involved with teaching, not management. Is that true? Maybe. Or maybe he was just too sneaky to get caught. September 30th, 1985, 5,000 copies of the book of Rajneeshism are burned in the Rajneesh Purim crematorium. Rajneesh asked his followers to burn his books. In a very strange, atypical cult leader move, he declared his religion was over. He said Sheila was the one who created Rajneeshism, not him. He claimed not to be religion, nor to be a religious leader. He released the Rajneeshis from the rules regarding their traditional clothing, said for the first time in all humankind, the religion has died. Then he ordered his followers to burn Sheila's robes. He also told the Rajneeshis to stop cooperating with the FBI because they're trying to destroy what he built. On October 23rd, 1985, federal grand jury in Portland secretly indicts Rajneesh and seven others in a 35-count indictment, charging them with immigration fraud, among other crimes. The INS 
then referred the case to the U.S. Attorney for Oregon, Charlie Turner, right? The guy they tried to fucking kill. October 25th, 1985, Wasco County Grand Jury secretly indicts Sheila, Shanti, and Ma Prem Puja on charges of attempted murder for trying to kill the uh, Rajneesh's, you know, doctor. Also charged with conspiracy and assault. October 27th, 1985, Rajneesh, likely warned about federal charges coming his way, flees on a jet. FBI fa- finds out he's trying to go to the B- Bermuda because they can't extradite him. And they know that he's going to stop in Charlotte, North Carolina to refuel. So they have agents waiting, arrest him in Charlotte on October 28th. Sheila Shanti uh, Puja arrested in West Germany. Uh, former Mayor Diva Krishna secretly signs a plea deal with state and federal authorities uh, to be a prosecution witness in their trials. November 1st, 1985, U.S. magistrate denies Rajneesh bail in Charlotte, orders him to be extradited to Oregon. November 6th, 1985, residents of the town vote 34 to 0 to change the name back to Antelope. Oh, man, those 34 OG Antelope residents fucking pumped. Holy shit, Marlon. Mark your fucking calendar again. This is our victory day. Bacon is back, baby. I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna miss seeing some of those titties around town, but not as much as I miss that goddamn bacon. Woo! A uh, flagpole now sits outside Antelope Post Office with a plaque that says, dedicated to those of this community who throughout the Rajneesh invasion and occupation of 1981 to 1985 remained, resisted, and remembered. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for the good of men to do nothing. Edmund Burke. Rajneesh arrived back in Portland, November 7th, 1985. Uh, November 8th, Rajneesh released on $500,000 bail. November 14th, 1985, Rajneesh pleads guilty to two federal felonies, pays $400,000 in fines and prosecution costs, and then fucking bounces to India. His lawyers advised that he make a deal and get out. He felt that he couldn't withstand the stress of uh, an extended trial. November 22nd, 1985, former mayor Diva Krishna appears in the Wasco County Circuit Court, pleads guilty to state racketeering charges, and U.S. District Court to plead... Uh, uh, pleads guilty to federal immigration conspiracy charges. Attorney General Fraunmeyer files a 22-page affidavit uh, outlining the actions of Rajneesh and Sheila and how they controlled Rajneesh Purim. New mayor, Prem Niram, tells commune members that night on the ranch that they uh, probably need to find a new place to live. They're shutting, shit, they're shutting shit down. Seek enlightenment elsewhere. Tough titties for everybody. December 5th, 1985, Attorney General Fraunmeyer follows a civil racketeering case in the Wasco County Circuit Court against 26 different Rajneeshi organizations. One resident of Antelope found some evidence that helped him out in a local dumps, uh, dumpster. Found a, a World Festival poster, wanted to keep it. When he looked really close at it, saw some notes that said, shred this. Notes contained info on arranged marriages, mail monitoring, other illegal activities. December 10th, 1985, U.S. District Court Judge Helen J. Fry voids the incorporation of Rajneesh Purim deciding that the city's creation violated a constitutional provision separating church and state, U.S. bankruptcy judge Elizabeth Paris appoints two trustees to oversee liquidation. December 13th, five Rajneeshis plead guilty in Portland to immigration charges. One pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit electronic eavesdropping. Non-Rajneeshis sworn in as mayor and uh, council city council members in Antelope, which ends any Rajneeshi influence left in the town. December 19th, two more Rajneeshis plead guilty to conspiracy to commit electronic eavesdropping. December 20th, a uh, district court in uh, Portland indicts Sheila and 20 more Rajneeshis on electronic eavesdropping conspiracy charges. One more person pleads guilty. Sheila eventually will plead guilty to mass poison and wiretapping and receive a four and a half year uh, sentence and almost half a million dollars in fines. Shanti pleads guilty to attempted murder and will serve 10 years in federal prison. Don't be back to 1986 uh, or jumping ahead now. Excuse me, Rajneesh is back in India doing the same shit he was doing before he left uh, for Oregon. Back at Pune. Grows his ashram there to 15,000 members, renames himself Osho. This Osho name is an honorific title uh, used for teachers or masters in Japan, especially in Zen Buddhism. Uh, by this point, Rajneesh's health is deteriorating, enlightenment apparently hard in your constitution. And by the end of 89, he's no longer speaking publicly. Then on January 19th, 1990, he dies at the ashram in Pune with his doctor by his side. He's only 58. His last words were, tough titties. Uh, no, his last words were, what did the librarian and the snake both say to each other? Shh. No, uh, can you again? No, his last real words were, I leave you my dream. His cause of death, heart failure. Sheila believes to this day that Rajneesh overdosed by his inner circle, a group of 20 people who were close to him and had access to his resources. She's currently 72, living in Switzerland, remarried to a Swiss man, another follower of Rajneesh. She went on to operate two care facilities for elderly people. That's scary. Uh, with dementia or schizophrenia. She served her sentence, paid off every dollar of her fine, 
Uh, another Netflix documentary, this one focused on her, was released in Netflix uh, or in 2021 called Searching for Sheila. I'm not going to see it. Pretty much universally panned by critics and audiences. Uh, after Bhagwan's death, his movement has continued. He burned some books, said he ended his religion, but nope. Thousands of his books continue to be sold every year in the world. Uh, multiple languages. His ashram renamed the Osho Institute, right? The Osho International Meditation Resort I spoke of. And they attract up to 200,000 visitors a year. An additional Rajneeshi spread his beliefs uh, around, you know, from hundreds of meditation centers all over the world. In the early 2000s, the movement had 750 centers located in more than 60 countries. Holy shit. Followers have worked hard to redefine the cult's history through writing and publishing Bhagwan's books and seminars, tried to erase their past controversies. You can find uh, uh, out more about him at oshonews.com. Rancho Rajneesh, purchased by Dennis Washington, billionaire developer from Montana. He paid $3.65 million, tried to turn the land into a resort, but ran into zoning problems. So in 1996, he gifted the ranch to Young Life, a Christian youth organization. Young Life turned it into a resort-style summer camp with a lake, pool, zip lines, water park, go-kart track, 88,000 square foot sports center. They maintain the old cult large recreation hall, several of the original Rajneeshi houses. Most of the houses and structures in Rajneesh Purim abandoned and in disrepair. And that takes us to the present and out of this cult, cult, cult timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Uh, real quick uh, additional sponsor break. Time Suck is brought to you today by Whipple Tough Titties Edition. Your doctor told you you had to stop drinking energy drinks because you've eaten several holes through your stomach. Tough titties. Pound that shit. Winners never quit. Wife's worried about your blood pressure. Tough titties. Life is pressure. Pound it and crush the empty can in her fucking forehead. Thinking about not finishing the can because your hands are shaking, you're seeing double, and you can actually hear your heartbeat skipping? Tough titties! Drink enough Whipple, and you no longer need a heart. Whipple is life. Whipple is death. Whipple is true enlightenment in liquid toxic chemical form. Buy some Whipple Tough Titties! Edition today. Available in Root Beer Chakra and Black Cherry Thunder Dick flavors. All right. I had some of that black cherry uh, thunder dick this morning. It's uh, it's fucking tasty. I actually fucking died a couple hours ago, but you know I'm, I'm still here recording. Uh, let's wrap up. What do I make of Chandra Mohan Jain, aka Bhagwan Rajneesh, aka Osho, and his religion now typically called the Rajneesh movement? I think, like most religious movements, uh, it's at best unnecessary, at worst destructive and dangerous. Why would anyone pay to go stay at some retreat? Sign up for meditation classes. Be told uh, that all old religions are wrong and that uh, true enlightenment can only be found through being guided along some path of self-actualization by someone schooled in the teachings of a guy who wanted to spread AIDS around the world. Some dude who used a massive amount of his followers' money to buy so many Rolls Royces and Rolexes. Some dude who talked like he was doing a bad impression of fucking Cobra Commander from G.I. Joe. Some dude who got women to pay him to fuck them to help them become enlightened. Some dude who organized encounter sessions that turned into exercises and gang rape. Guy was a fucking clown, a master of spitting out shit that sounded cool but meant nothing. You know, charlatan, a hypocrite who preached uh, for you to break free from the chains of your old religions only to let him chain you to a new one. What a strange chapter the Rajneeshis would add to the history of Oregon. Parts of the story seems too strange to be real, but it all happened. Today, the remains of Rajneesh Purim serve as that Christian youth camp, right? An ironic end to this anti-old religion cult story. Sheila had one final thing to say to the people of Oregon that I think is worth sharing. Rajneesh Purim is a big living opera. Sheila, a soprano. Bhagwan, a tenor. Rajneesh Purim, the setting. Operas are, at the end, always tragic. But there were so many facets, so many dimensions in this opera. I would like to say, people of Oregon, think yourselves lucky that this opera came your way. That's pretty fucking funny. I mean, very entertaining, right? Gave those people an antelope. A lot of shit to talk about that I bet some of them are still talking about today. Let's now look back at this strange opera and also learn something new. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was born in the small town of Kuchwada, India. His parents worked with his uncle at a cloth shop in town, wanted him to do something similar, but Rajneesh had other plans. A gifted speaker and passionate about education, he left home for university and studied all his favorite subjects. 
English, logic, philosophy. Did a lot of religious studies on his own. Number two, Rajneesh and his devotees fled India in 1981 to move to the former Big Muddy Ranch in Central Oregon. Built a sprawling commune in the middle of the desert complete with houses, shopping, roads, a landing strip, gardens, irrigation systems, massive gathering hall, right? A two-story shopping mall. Constructed a paradise for the cult that grew to around 7,000 people with the goal of adding over 90,000 more in and around Antelope, Oregon before assassination plans, uh, immigration problems, infighting, resistance from locals, and voter fraud brought it all down. Number three, Rajneesh was known for being a sex-positive guru. Preached sex is the first step on the path to super-consciousness, that his followers would, should embrace their sexuality rather than repress it. Cult members participated in encounter groups and dynamic meditation exercises that often involved sexual acts, even orgies. Sex was encouraged, pregnancy forbidden, relationships discouraged. The Rajneeshis appeared to many to be the ultimate example of a free love society, uh, but then former members began to speak out on rapes, pedophilia, uh, and more going on there at the compound. So that free love, not always so loving. Number four, Ma Anand Sheila was the face and leader of the cult during Rajneesh's long period of silence in Oregon. She was a ruthless leader, willing to do anything to ensure the success of Rajneesh Purim, including buying out the town of Antelope, orchestrating bioterror attacks, plotting assassinations, and organizing one of the largest wiretapping operations in U.S. history. Number five, new info, odd cult-to-cult connection. One Rajneeshi follower of note we didn't mention was Shannon Joe Ryan, a.k.a. Ma Amrita Pritam, who joined the group using her father's life insurance money and lived at the cult's first big compound in India. Shannon was the daughter of Leo Ryan, the California congressman who got gunned down investigating the People's Temple religious cult, a.k.a. Jonestown, in 1978. Fuck, her dad trying to save people from dying on a cult compound. And she goes to live on a cult compound. And she did that before he died. Her family must have been fucking furious, right? Shannon told the press, I feel as if my father came to see this. Uh, He would see that there's just, they're exact opposites as far as I can see. I mean, I'm sure that anybody that was here could see that. I mean, if he had been to Jonestown and survived that and had come here, he would have seen that there was different as night and day. And he would have been totally supportive. Yeah, I fucking doubt it, Shannon. I really doubt it. Uh, December of 1978, Shannon, a.k.a. Ma Prem Amrita Pritam, married Peter Waite, uh, possibly Peter White, but maybe not spelled that way, a.k.a. Swami Anand Sabhuti. She even spoke at their wedding saying, we're here to forget the tragedy. With Bhagwan, even Kool-Aid becomes champagne. What a fucking creepy thing to say. Yikes! Time suck. Top five takeaways. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. The cult leader who built a city in Oregon has been sucked. And if you didn't like how I sucked it, well, you know what? Tough fucking titties. Suck 298. Episode 300 coming up quick. What am I going to do for that one? I think I'm going to have to uh, drop acid. So I'm not sure what topic I'm going to pick. Uh, but uh, I, I have a general idea. I have a general idea. Uh, thanks to the Bad Magic Productions team. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley for production. Staying late for this one. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. Logan, the Art Warlock, Keith, creating merch at badmagicmerch.com and running socials with Liz, the Enchantress Hernandez. Thanks to Olivia Lee for her initial research this week. Thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page. And thanks to Becky, Jesse, and the Mod Squad. Now I'm making sure Discord keeps running smooth. And Reverend Dr. Joe as well. Next week, uh, I get to pick the episode. I'm going to blame COVID on me thinking that this week's episode was the first episode in June and that the Spacers had picked it. They did pick it, but I got the wrong date. Uh, I did it early. I fucking hopped up on too much cold medicine this past week. So uh, I was going to do true crime again in two weeks, but I'm going to do it next week instead and save, I think I'm going to do a Wild West episode for LSD. I just don't want graphic sex crimes in my fucking head when I'm going to have a hard time processing what's real versus what's not real. So next week, uh, we're going to look at not just one killer, but four. Led by ringleader Robin Gecht, who one judge would say made Manson look like a Boy Scout, the Ripper Crew was a group of four men who terrorized Chicago in the early 1980s. Robin Gecht, his carpentry assistant slash murder buddy, Edward Spritzer, and two brothers barely out of their teens, Andrew and Thomas Cocorales, would go on a reign of terror on Chicago's women, starting with the murder of Linda Sutton in May of 1981. This foursome of terror would kidnap, assault, murder 18 women over the next year and a half, maybe more. They admitted they couldn't remember all the details of their attacks or who they attacked. There had been too many victims, and uh, all the victims, you know, that uh, they did attack were attacked brutally. 
Finally, one survivor would eventually give police a lead they needed to catch the Ripper crew once and for all. And when the crew started confessing, police shocked to hear the details. Uh, Satanism, a secret chapel, mutilation, masturbation, even a box full of women's breasts the crew would masturbate on and consume as a part of some fucking weird satanic ritual, in their minds at least. Uh, All that and more in this fucked up episode. So definitely not going to be tripping for that one. Some members of the Ripper crew would allege that Gecht was supernaturally powerful, able to make people do his bidding with a single look, a cult leader in a cult of four. Or did the other members of the Ripper crew just blame Gecht because they didn't want to be held responsible for the horrors they committed? The bloody saga of Chicago's Ripper crew next week on Time Suck. Right now, Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. Let's start with some adorableness. Uh, sent in by uh, Adorable Meat Sack, Amanda Topping. Amanda writes, Dan Dan the Time Suck Man, I've been a loyal space for quite some time now and got my husband hooked on your show and we started dating. We're both now suckers, creepers, and dummies. Every week, we both listen to the Bad Magic Podcast, laugh about them when we're both home from work. We just got married last October, found out in March that we're expecting. I did an early DNA test to find out the baby's sex, want to find a way to tell my husband the results. It would make his day to hear it in your sultry voice. If you see this email, would you please tell Will Topping that this November, he's going to become the most incredible father to our little chupacabro, our little boy. Thank you so much, and Bojangles is a good boy, but cats are better. Amanda Topping. P.S. My only regret is that this email isn't longer. Well, congrats, Amanda. And Will, please raise Amanda and I's son, as as I would. I'm going to miss the magical time that Amanda and I had together, but I just, I don't have time right now to raise our child. I'm sure you understand. Uh, Seriously, though, good job. You two did it. You put the penis in the right hole. And you're not shooting blanks. So, hail Nimrod. Uh, uh, Now, uh, you got a new space newt going to be unleashed upon the earth. May, may Nimrod and Lucifina guide him until adulthood. May Bojangles always protect him. And may Triple M, uh, I don't know, sing, sing some songs and shit. Another fun one now, coming in from a musical meat sack, Kenny Biles from Serious Matters, who writes, Hey Dan, just wanted to reach out and say thank you and the production team for entertaining us every day. I have two jobs that require me to sit in a truck or van overnight, and it makes it a little more bearable. I recently started to get my fiance and band involved in the Bad Magic podcast, and they're also hooked. I've listened to you guys religiously for the last two months. Finally thought I could reach, I should reach out. Not sure if this will reach you, but I just wanted to say that you give hope to the lower showbiz artists in the world. My band and I take much inspiration from what uh, for what you've done and accomplished. One of these days, you're going to receive a care package of merch from us. I'll make sure that everything is large tees, not XL. Thank the queen of the suck for me. After listening to her shut you down with your own shirt size on STD. It's fair. I don't know though, but now I'm, I don't know. Now I'm bigger. I don't know. Much love from, from Serious Matters and myself. Thank you so much. P.S. The band's name is Serious Matters. If you want to listen, you can find us on any streaming platform. We're a touring rock band from New Jersey. It would be wild if you actually listened. I hope you don't hate it, but if you do, I'm not sorry. It's just the music we make. Well, Kenny, thank you so much. I checked out Serious Matters on Spotify and uh, I think it falls musically somewhere in between Yoko Ono and Putin's Blueberry Hill. It reminds me of Father uh, Yod's Yahuwah 13. Show me. Just kidding. Come on. No, I listen to glitches and I listen to uh, night tears and good shit. You guys, great melodies, wonderful voice, nice and heavy. Hail Nimrod and go fucking get it. Uh, now for a heavier message regarding Holocaust denial from Savage Sack Ryan Anderson, who writes, have I got a story for you guys? Listen to this week's suck. Reminded me of hanging out with this guy I worked with. We used to ride motorcycles together and bar hop. I know not smart. Well, one night we're sitting at a bar drinking. We start talking to these guys behind us who just ha- so happened to be German engineers in town working on machines at a local toothpaste factory. After a brief chat, my friend, in quotes, and I turned back around and some World War-, World War II talk came up and my friend proclaimed, yeah, all that bullshit the Jews lie about. I squinted at him and asked, wait, are you fucking with me? You know the Holocaust was real, right? Come to find out he did not. It devolved into myself turning back to the engineers, asking them, will you tell this silly asshole your country exterminated millions of Jews? Their jaws dropped. They all looked ashamed. No one said anything. Hindsight, probably not the right time and place. But when you've got the source, why not use it? After much drunken and passionate arguing, I finally gave in and left, told him to go fuck himself. Haven't seen him since. I had known that guy for years. Never once suspected he would be a denier, let alone an actual neo-Nazi, which came out in our argument. He kept a Nazi iron cross in his vest. Just goes to show how well hidden some of these assholes are. If this if this gets read, I would love to hear a fuck you, Brooks, you Nazi bitch. 
Anyways, as always, love bad magic. Sad that his be dumb is coming to a close, but glad you're not killing yourself anymore. Thanks for all the content, making something to obsess over. Much love from Tennessee. Space Lizard Ryan. Ryan, good on you, man, for, for telling that guy to fuck off. So yeah, so fuck you, Brooks, you Nazi bitch. Yeah, beliefs like that can come from very unexpected sources, which is uh, always shocking. Uh, and careful out there riding. Can't wait to start learning to ride myself, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, and yeah, good on you for saying something. And now let's end on another nice one. Something poignant from a formerly sad sect who now is happier. Yay. Raven writes, Master Sucker, Bojangles Peanut butter, butter Collector, Lord of All Things Curious. I just got to tell you how much your podcast helps me every day. I've struggled with depression for most of my life and I can always count on you to brighten my day. Also wanted to tell you that I just listened to your transgender episode and as a trans woman, uh, that hit really hard. I had to take a break during work so I didn't burst into tears. My family still has not accepted me after being out for more than a year. Uh, came out on my 17th birthday, it turned into the worst birthday I've ever had. Anyway, having you, a man I greatly admire and respect, affirm my feelings and who I am meant a lot. So thank you. I also wanted to ask, my girlfriend and I wanted to start a true crime podcast after she moves in, and I wanted to ask permission to use your podcast as a source. I know how much work you and Bad Magic in general put into your all's research. Of course, I will also do research myself. As hard as you work, you're not right every time, and I admire your ability to understand that. Email me back if you ever get a chance. I know you're busy, so no rush. And again, thank you for everything you do. Sorry for how long this is. That's what he said. And keep on sucking. Uh, well, Raven, I'm going to do you one better. Then write you back, right? Because I'm going to, I'm going to, I read it back. So I guess I did, I did you one better already. Uh, yeah, you have permission to use our, uh, you know, sources or our notes as a source. And, you know, you can just get those on the app for each episode. And good on you for not using that as the only source. Because you're right. I'm not going to get it right every time, despite how hard we try. Always important to use multiple sources, which is why we do that. And sorry about your fam. Uh, you know, maybe I guess just give them time. You know, I truly hope they come around. I hope they learn that they don't always have to agree with everyone's choices or even understand everyone's choices to still love someone and support them. I hope they understand that character is a lot more important than gender affiliation. I'm much more concerned with the quality of my kid's character than I am with, uh, you know, how they identify or what genitalia they have. You know, at the end of the day, that stuff is not that fucking important. I mean, it's kind of important, you know, I mean, I love my dick, but if I had a pussy, I'd love my pussy so much too. I give it so much attention. And I know that you're not just talking about what I'm talking about right now, but I can't help but go for the joke sometimes. Come on, show this. Uh, now go fuck that podcast up, Raven, with your girlfriend. I hope you're smiling right now. Hail Lucifina, and thanks for writing in. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Another Bad Magic Productions podcast in the bag meat sex. Please don't try and build a free love compound that's pretty rapey. And then end up wanting to kill almost everybody in the world with AIDS. Those titties are too fucking rough. Find some sweet or teats instead. And just keep on sucking. Add Magic Productions. Tough titties. Motherfuckers.